Hello and welcome to the 2020 Virtual Policy Forum. My name is Jeff Lutz and I'm the president of AOPA. Unfortunately, we aren't able to meet in person this year, but it's good to know that so many people are here virtually and rest assured, we're gonna make the most of our time together. I know every one of you is dealing with the massive impacts of COVID-19. I know all our businesses are severely impacted. I know your personal lives have been upended. I know this because I'm experiencing the same impacts myself. It's too soon to tell the full impact and the heartbreaks of COVID-19, but I know given the character of the P&O community, we'll get through this and we'll recover. In a few minutes, you're gonna hear from the rest of AOPA's, you'll hear from AOPA's Director of Government Affairs, Justin Beeland, who's gonna provide a 101 on Congress. Following that, AOPA board member and chair of the Government Affairs Committee, Terry Couple, will share insights on how to be an effective advocate. We'll then be joined by Senator Tammy Duckworth, who will share what she what she is doing to support P &O, the p and profession. After we hear from Senator Duckworth, Justin will be joined by Joe McTernan, AOPA's Director of Coding and Reimbursement Services, Education and Programming, and Katrina McDonald, President of Lynchpin Strategies, to get into the issues of PAC impacting O&P. They'll start with the COVID-19 legislation to date, review the actions taken by HHS and CMS, and discuss what other actions are possible. We'll continue to push to see the Medicare Orthotics and Prosthetics Patient-Centered Care Act, that's HR 5262, we'll continue to press for it to become law. We have an exciting new strategy to discuss regarding the separation portion of this legislation. And in addition, this pivotal legislation will continue advocating for funding for ONP education, research, as well as legislation that ensures that veterans can get their choice of P&O provider. Before we adjourn, Justin will walk you through how to contact your legislators about issues being discussed. Taking action is easy and will only take a few minutes, so please take the time to do it. Thank you all, and as those who do take action will be entered into a drawing for VIP services at the 2020 National Assembly. Thank you again for being here today and lending your voice as an advocate for the P&O profession and the patients we serve. Together, we can transform prosthetics and orthotics industry. I'll now turn it over to Justin. Justin. Thanks, Jeff, much appreciated. Uh, welcome everybody. Thank you for attending our virtual policy forum. I am very sorry we could not all be together in Washington DC right now. Um, but I hope you and your, uh, you know, your loved ones are, are safe and greatly appreciate everybody tuning into the virtual, the new virtual format that we're using for our forum. Uh, uh, as Jeff just said, we got a lot to cover today. Uh, so we're going to start with a, a Congress 101 and then uh, Terry will talk about how to be an effective advocate. Senator Duckworth will join us. Um, I want to remind everybody we do have a hashtag. Uh, normally these are things you use at live events, but we're not live, uh, at least in person. So, but the, the hashtag is still uh, active. Please use AOPA 2020 to talk about anything that we're discussing today. Uh, that is of course uh, AOPA's ha uh, handle, American OMP, and mine is at Justin Beeland. If you have anything you want to talk to me about, I'm happy to, to listen. Uh, so I'm just curious, we're gonna open up our first poll. Um, we, we've got some online polling that we're gonna use throughout the duration of today's, uh, tonight's, today's uh, policy forum. Uh, and I'm just curious by the numbers, uh, how many folks have attended uh, the policy forum um, before? Uh, this is obviously our first virtual event, uh, but who's attended uh, in person before? So I'm gonna uh, open up this poll, I hope, um, and let folks answer uh, how many times they've joined us. You should see, I hope you see that on your screen. Uh, 
And once we have our, uh, our poll answers in, uh, I think Ashley or Joy is going to give us our, our results. So we'll take a couple of minutes to do that. We'll spend a lot of time talking about how, uh, how Congress works. If you have attended the policy forum before, you've, you've heard some of my jokes, um, but I've written some new ones, so it's not gonna be all the same materials. <laughs> Glad everybody will be hearing some new stuff. We still have some votes coming in, so we're gonna give a few more seconds. And again, greatly appreciated. Uh, I know if we were we were in person, we'd be on the Hill right now as we speak. We would have done our, our education portion session yesterday and we'd be on the Hill today. So downside is we're not together on the Hill. The upside is uh, I'm wearing pajama pants, so we've got that going. All right. Looks like, looks like the polls closed. Justin, can you see the results or would you like me to read them? Uh, I cannot actually. So if you wouldn't mind yeah. reading those, I appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, so uh, poll results are in and uh, we're showing the results now on your screens. Um, so you can see that 53% reported that never, that this is their first time. 17% reported once, 10% reported two to four times and 20% reported more than four times. Excellent. That's a great mix. So welcome to all the new folks. Over half of uh, half of our attendees are newbies. So greatly appreciate you tuning in. Uh, again, this would be a, a lot more uh, personal if we were together, but uh, this will give you a rough overview of what we talk about during our policy forms. Um, so the first thing I want to talk about a little bit is, is how Congress works. Uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, chaos and confusion, I think, uh, around how Congress gets things done. Uh, and when folks come to DC, that's the thing, uh, one of the things they wanna know about is, well, how does actually, how do, how do things work in Congress and how does a bill become a law? So to start with that, uh, we're gonna have to go all the way back to high school and I'm gonna let you watch uh, something you've probably seen and heard a hundred times before, but it really, really never gets old. Oops, if I can get it to select that. There we go. Well, you sure gotta climb a lot of steps to get to this Capitol building here in Washington. Well, I wonder who that sad little scrap of paper is. I'm just a bill. Yes, I'm only a bill. And I'm sitting here on Capitol Hill. Well, it's a long, long journey to the Capitol City. It's a long, long wait while I'm sitting in committee. But I know I'll be a law someday. I hope and pray that I will, but today I am still just a bill. Hey, Bill, you certainly have a lot of patience and courage. Well, I got this far. When I started, I wasn't even a bill. I was just an idea. Some folks back home decided they wanted a law pass, so they called their local congressman, and he said, you're right, there ought to be a law. And he sat down and wrote me out and introduced me to Congress, and I became a bill. And I'll remain a bill until they decide to put me a law. I'm just a bill. Yes, I'm only a bill. And I got as far as Capitol Hill. Well, now I'm stuck in committee and I'll sit here and wait while a few key congressmen discuss and debate whether they should let me be alone. Oh, I and pray that they will. But today I am still just a bill. Listen to those congressmen arguing. Is all that discussion and debate about you? Yeah, I'm one of the lucky ones. Most bills never even get this far. I hope they decide to report on me favorably, otherwise I may die. Die? Yeah, die in committee. But it looks like I'm gonna live. Now I go to the House of Representatives and they vote on me. If they vote, yes, what happens? Then I go to the Senate and the whole thing starts all over again. Oh no. Oh yes. I'm just a bill. Yes, I'm only a bill. And if they vote for me on Capitol Hill, well, then I'm off to the White House where I'm waiting on line with a lot of other bills for the president to sign. And if he signs me, then I'll be all oh, I hope and pray that he will. But today I am still just a bill. You mean even if the whole Congress says you should be allowed, the president can still say no? Yes, that's called a veto. If the president vetoes me, I have to go back to Congress and they vote on me again. And by that time, you're so. By that time, it's very unlikely that you become a law. 
It's not easy to become a law, is it? No. But I hope and pray that I will. But today I am still just a bill. Besides the bill, now you're a law. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So good news. So that bill becomes a law, which is great news. And that young, plucky little guy grew up uh, to become Senator Jim Langford of Oklahoma. So everybody wins at the end of the bill becoming a law. Um, and on paper, whatever everything that the little bill just saying about looks like this. Um, this is how you learned it in high school civics. The House of the Senate introduces a bill, goes to the subcommittee, then full committee, then to the House floor or the Senate floor. Then they get together and iron out their differences. It goes to the president, it gets signed. The whole thing is so nice and neat and clean. And of course it rarely, if ever, actually works like that. Uh, so a much better depiction of how all this comes together uh, would look a lot like this. Uh, this chaos and confusion right here. Um, this is uh, the, the, all the fine minutia and the millions of different moving parts that can go into making a bill a lot. It's a lot. Uh, and it's almost not even worth getting into the number of things that can derail or randomly propel it to get uh, passed. Uh, the one thing I do want to draw to your attention is all of these uh, little guys uh, on this thing that I've just put in squares. Uh, so these are the places where we as the public can interact with Congress to enact change in a bill. If there's something about a bill that we like or that we don't like, something that's missing that we want to get in there, these are all the opportunities we have to get that into the bill. Um, because of that, because there's so much minutia put into this, you saw the bill standing, uh, as he said, in a long line of bills for the president to sign. In point of fact, there are never that many in any Congress. This is a, uh, what you see on your screen is a list of the number of bills that have been passed in the past few Congresses. Uh, it averages about 3%. Very, very, it's very, very hard to get a bill passed into law. Um, that is why AOPA has been working on some of the same legislation for a while, because it just takes a long time to create awareness of the legislation and the specific needs that we're trying to address in that bill. Um, and that is true of any piece of legislation. Um, it is very hard. Looking at this another way, and I went all the way back to 2001 on this chart uh, for a reason that I'll talk about in a second. Um, only 3% uh, in the past Congress, even going back to 2001, uh, where you had, of course, 9-11, and it's viewed as the kind of last time that there was this bipartisanship in Congress to address uh, the needs of the country post 9-11, even then only 4% of those bills became law. Um, that contributes to this perception that um, Congress doesn't do anything anymore. Well, they used to do so much. There was, there was all of this bipartisanship and everything was great and they passed so many laws. Historically, that's just not true. It is extraordinarily difficult for a bill to become a law. There aren't that many uh, that do that. And it's not necessarily uh, because of a lack of partisanship, it's just because it's difficult. That said, there is an increased lack of partisan, bipartisanship in Congress. Um, uh, and one of the things that people think about Congress, because it is so hard for a bill to become a law, because so few uh, bill, uh, bills get passed into law, uh, and people think Congress doesn't do anything, there's this increasing disapproval of Congress. Um, and so this is a chart that I pulled just yesterday. Uh, there's a spike in approval because people are happy with how Congress has been reacting to the coronavirus. So you see that uptick. Uh, in approval and a downtick in disapproval. Um, but traditionally, um, people don't think Congress is doing a particularly good job um, simply because they're not doing enough. In point of fact, there was a poll that I love. This came out uh, probably five or six years ago um, where people asked uh, the public, uh, "Do you, what do you have a higher opinion of? Is it Congresses or cockroaches that you like better? Uh, surprisingly, 2% more people said cockroaches. Uh, what do you have a higher opinion of, Congress or headlights? That number to me is kind of stunning. 67% said headlights. Um, because there's this perception that Congress doesn't do anything. Um, that could also be, I mean, you see the one about Congress and Nickelback. Um, I understand Nickelback is a massive point of contention uh, among a lot of people. Um, that is true, in fact, in Congress too. Uh, in fact, last year there was a debate on the House floor that got fairly contentious about the quality of Nickelback music. Now, if you think Congress doesn't do anything and these are the headlines that you see, that would probably contribute to that perception. I don't doubt that. Um, but it's not a matter of Congress doing less. It's about increasing uh, lack of partisanship. There are more avenues now than there used to be for uh, both sides to go on Twitter, to go on talk uh, news, uh, talk radio, talk news, uh, and talk about what the other side is or is not doing. Um, and there is an ideological divide. More uh, Republicans have pushed further to the right, more Democrats have pushed further to the left. They are an, adhered to the base of their own party. Um, and that hasn't necessarily contributed to a lack of 
legislation, um, which as we've seen has been that way historically, but it has contributed to a lack of, of bipartisanship. Uh, another way to look at this is the political middle has simply disappeared. There aren't people crossing the aisles like there used to be uh, to find common ground and work together. Um, one more visual on this is, uh, and this one might be a little bit hard to see on your screen, but the gray lines that you see here, um, if I can get my arrow to come up, these gray lines represent every time that someone in the Republican Party worked with someone uh, in the Democratic Party. Um, so you see these lines, people reaching across the aisle to uh, work on legislation. These all but disappeared in the mid-2000s. Um, if this continued on, uh, it would stay about the same. There would be very, very, very few gray lines. No one on the left is working with anyone on the right. Um, so what happens? Um, I'm going to give you two reasons why I think uh, that a lack of bipartisanship has crept into Congress. Um, I'm saying don't at me because I'm sure you have your own reasons. Um, mine aren't necessarily right or wrong, but the evidence would suggest that they have increased uh, uh, partisanship on the health. The first one that I'm going to talk about is earmarks. Um, and I can't put up a standard definition of what an earmark is, uh, because as this uh, text will show you, there really isn't a standard definition. Um, earmarks mean different things to different people. For our purposes, we're going to say that they were, because they don't exist anymore, they were uh, individual small projects that members of Congress could put in their appropriations bill uh, that would fund, say, a uh, reconstruction of a museum or a program at a museum. Uh, a new program at a library, uh, a small rural water project uh, in their district, um, uh, increased broadband in their district, small things that were only for their district. They didn't benefit the country and they didn't go through any sort of congressional approval process. Um, because of that, uh, the Office of Management and, Management and Budget, which is the uh, organization that writes the budget for the presidential administration, whoever the president is, they get OMB, uh, to write uh, the budget, the proposed budget for the year. Congress usually ignores that. In fact, they always ignore that these days. Uh, and they put in their own projects and things like that. But the OMB really didn't like that because the president set his agenda and his funding goals. Oh, and the congressional process of earmarks would just circumvent that. Well, I know that I didn't have this project approved, but I like it um, and I want it in there. To look at this in modern parlance, to think of this in a way that probably resonates a little bit more with us today. Um, let's say that I have toilet paper. And you don't have toilet paper. Um, I probably, you probably want some of my toilet paper. So I'm going to say, all right, well, I'll give you that now with the expectation that when I run out, and I'm going to run out, um, that you're going to give me some of yours. You scratch my back and I'll scratch yours. I won't veto your $2 million project for a, a library in your, in your district if you don't veto a $3 million uh, water, rural water project in my district. So that served as a series of checks and balances within Congress. I'm not going to mess with your programs if you don't mess with mine. And as a result, it uh, created this kind of bipartisanship. They, everybody knew how the game was played. And as a result, everybody sort of got what they wanted. And it kind of led to um, a little bit more communication and a little bit more bipartisanship. Uh, on paper, it looked as chaotic as this. So this is pulled from the Department of Interior, I think in 2004, 2000, I'm sorry, in 2000, uh, 1994, 1995. You would see these lists upon lists of projects. Uh, you know, there's never ones that are huge dollar amounts. They're like you see, $2 million, $350,000. So all of these little things would show up in these bills. They didn't require authorization. They didn't require any sort of uh, oversight. You just submitted what you wanted to the chair of the to the chair of the committee with jurisdiction, and they would put it in this bill, and everyone would get a little bit more money for their district. Um, eventually, though, it spun a little bit out of control. And if this has, of course, always been uh, often been referred to as pork barrel spending, um, that's the sort of negative way to look at it, um, because of course it did eventually get out of control, and we're going to talk about that now. So, this is a list of uh, a very small part of the list of projects from the 2005 uh, transportation uh, funding bill. Um, none of these should stand out except for one. There's one for, you know, 7.5 million, 2.4 million. Um, standard projects across uh, various parts of the United States. Um, this one, however, should probably stand out. $100 million for the planning, design, and construction of a bridge joining the island of Gravina to the community of Ketchikan in Alaska. That sounds like a worthwhile project. We don't want the people on the island of Gravina to be stranded there. That would be terrible. We want them to be able to get to the mainland so that they can enjoy life in Alaska. That seems to make sense. On the other hand, $100 million for a price tag on that seems a little steep. Um, so USA Today started sniffing around a little bit, wondering why uh, there was a necessity for a $100 million bridge. Uh, and they ended up writing an article uh, 
pointing out that Don Young, who was the chair of the Committee of Jurisdiction at the time, um, had come right out and said that his bill was stuffed like a turkey with all kinds of projects specifically for Alaska, including that bridge that we just saw, which was going to end up eventually costing $223 million to build a bridge as long as the Golden Gate and higher than the Brooklyn Bridge. And you'd think, well, that's a pretty big bridge, but we still want the people from the island of Gravina to get to the mainland. As it happens, there was already a link uh, by ferry uh, that took 10 minutes uh, and it has worked for years and that nobody in Alaska really had any complaints about. Um, now, I'll admit when I started doing this, this uh, was in 2005, when I started talking about what became to, know, uh, became, came to be known as the Bridge to Nowhere, I never actually looked out on, on a map. So when I was redoing my slides this year, I got a little curious. And I thought, well, what does that look like? How small is the island of Gravina? When you call something the Bridge to Nowhere, one assumes that it actually goes nowhere. So for our, just, just to illuminate my audience today, I'm putting up this map. And as you can see, here's the island of Gravina. It's not exactly a tiny island in the middle of nowhere. Here's the uh, mainland of Ketchikan, and smack dab in the middle of both of them is an international airport. So calling it a bridge to nowhere is a little bit of a misnomer because this looks like it's not nowhere at all. Um, but as it happens, so much news came out about this and we heard so much about the bridge to nowhere and uh, eventually both projects, there was this bridge that you just learned about and another one in Anchorage. There were two bridges to nowhere in Alaska that year. Um, both of them were eventually shot down in Congress um, and led to a much greater uh, uh, looking, a lot of people snooping around and looking at what went into earmarks, what kind of earmarks got covered, what was Congress funding in these bills. And as a result, uh, in 2011, the earmarks were gone. Um, they were basically, uh, President Obama came on, said he was going to get rid of them. A lot of members of Congress eventually signed on to the plan and earmarks are gone. So, um, and I think this uh, story from the New York Times kind of tells both sides of this tale. So at the top, you see taxpayer finance, Teapot Museum, studies on the mating habits of crabs, sure, we probably could have lived without those, and those are certainly examples of pork barrel spending. But then in the second paragraph, you hear about some projects that are, seem to be a little more, bit more worthwhile. Um, so in addition to creating that level of bipartisanship, you also had projects that were much, much harder to get funded in Congress. As a result, um, as the years have gone on, um, more and more uh, members of Congress, more and more members of the media have said, there's got to be a way to do these where they make a little bit more sense. Um, Maybe we call it, if you, even if you choose to call them political corruption, um, they still work. Um, however, uh, there has been talk in recent years of uh, earmarks coming back. So I think the things that were, that I'm, two things that I'm going to be talking about today in terms of why Congress has stopped working together, both of them may be on the way out a little bit. And so the first one here, earmarks, could be on the way back. We probably won't see it, uh, well, we certainly won't see it in this Congress. They have much better things to do. But um, when things settle down a bit, maybe we'll see a, a return to this sort of normalcy of earmarks. There will definitely be more, more oversight on them, um, but uh, they could come back. So earmarks are, are the first thing that has certainly contributed to that uh, pulling apart of the left and the right. The other one uh, is based on this map, or at least the term comes from this map. And some of you have seen this before, but uh, way back uh, in the late 1800s, the governor of Massachusetts was a guy named Elbridge Jerry. Um, and he knew that he was going to lose his election. So he with, redrew uh, the districts uh, outside of Boston uh, to look a little crazy, but to secure, basically in, in, in secure the knowledge that all of the folks that lived in this weird looking dragon thing that you see were all going to vote for him. If you reshape the districts to benefit your party, obviously you're going to win uh, if, there's, if you draw more districts that support you than those that oppose you. Uh, the newspaper saw this weird thing that Elbridge Jerry had come up with. They said it looked like a salamander, and the term uh, gerrymander was born. Uh, so gerrymandering has been another political tool to ensure that members of Congress don't have to be bipartisan. If your district is drawn in such a way that there is no way you're going to lose because you, you're a Republican and 75% of your constituents are Republicans, you're not going to lose. Um, or at least the odds are very, very slim. Um, of course, we've seen uh, you know Democrats who have had uh, um, uh, competition from the other, from the far left, and they've lost. Uh, but generally, it's going to stay with that party in power. Uh, and this is especially timely because, of course, a lot of us now have either done or in the, or in the midst of doing our census. The census is out this year, and the census determines congressional districts. Um, specifically, it determines the number of people in each congressional district, and those districts are redrawn based on the population. Um, so this is an important time to be talking about this because, of course, the results of the census are going to determine who gets more or less 
House seats. Um, the number has been capped at 435 since 1963, so we can't add additional seats. All we can do is redraw these districts. Um, what's happened over the past few censuses is uh, those districts have been redrawn disproportionately to the party in power, so that you get districts that look like this. Um, these are not the way that congressional districts, the districts were intended to look. Um, you know, here in North Carolina, you've got this massive stretch of very thin district here that the member has to drive hours and hours to get from one end of to the end other because it was redrawn to benefit the party in power. Um, not based on population, not based on anything like that, just based on uh, the data of voter registrations. Um, most of these things have been ruled illegal, but the end of the day, if you know you're not going to get uh, beaten in your election because everyone in your district is the same party as you, where is the benefit to crossing the aisle? Why would I want to work with the other side? That's just going to infuriate my base. I'm not going to do that. Um, so there, it's it's contributed a lot to it. But again, like earmarks, we're seeing kind of a scale back on this. We're seeing a lot of people kind of smelling the waters of what this is. So there's been uh, 19 uh, challenges uh, to gerrymandering and redistricting across the country. Many of these have gone to the Supreme Court. Many of them are still pending. Uh, many of them, not many of them, but at least one of them will come up. Uh, as the Supreme Court meets by phone over the next few weeks uh, in this session. Um, and some of them have already been decided. So last year was the first time that we the, the congressional districts of Pennsylvania were we redrawn. Uh, they were have ruled by the Supreme Court to have been drawn in partisan fashion, favoring Republicans. Uh, and so they were redrawn uh, by independent uh, an independent group basically to make it uh, more uh, even. So here's what they used to look like around Pennsylvania. So you can see these bizarre looking, uh, districts and now it looks a little bit more like congressional districts are supposed to look where it's just a large block of land rather than these large zigzaggy things uh, and these challenges are ongoing there are more like I said more before the Supreme Court now um, so there you have two things that have uh, greatly contributed to uh, the gridlock that we find ourselves in today um, however uh, I want to stress and we're going to stress <laughs> a lot of this uh, that just because there are these divisions in party it doesn't mean uh, that Congress isn't doing anything. It doesn't mean that doesn't have a direct effect on us and our profession. Uh, it simply means that when you go into a Republican's office, they're going to talk about the bad stuff the Democrats are doing and vice versa. Uh, but it doesn't have any direct effect on the advocacy that we do and the grassroots advocacy that we want uh, our, our advocates to do. First thing I want to talk about before we get in, getting into the meat of what we're going to talk about today, which is all right. See why you're all here today to advocate on behalf of our profession. Uh, I do want to quickly talk about the difference between lobbying and advocacy. So I am a paid lobbyist. I work for AOP as the Director of Government Affairs. I am a registered lobbyist. Um, but there is a fine difference between lobbying and advocacy. Lobbying is when you are directly influencing an individual piece of legislation. Uh, later today, you're going to be hearing about a bill, HR 5262, uh, the Medicare uh, Patient-Centered Orthotics and Prost Medicare Orthotics and Prosthetics Patient-Centered Care Act, HR 5262. When I'm on the Hill talking about that, I am directly lobbying because it is a specific piece of legislation. Um, if you are talking to your member of Congress, your member of the State House, your mayor, any of that, a, a, in a general way about the work that you do, about legislation that would benefit you, that's advocacy, that's education, that's not lobbying. Um, I should also stress that lobbying is not a four-letter word. Um, sometimes there is a negative look upon lobbying, and we're going to get into that in a minute. Um, but lobbying is not negative. Lobbying is simply advocating for a cause that you believe in. Um, but I do want to talk about the differences between lobbying and advocacy. Um, so if there's a negative perception of lobbying, why do companies and corporations and associations hire lobbyists? Because it works. Uh, as you can see here, a 76,000% return on investment we are able to get things done. Um, but there is a perception both in the public uh, and among some on the Hill uh, that lobbyists aren't the best people to work with, that we're not truthful. And that is borne out by another question that was asked in that survey that we looked at earlier. What do you have a higher opinion of, Congress or lobbyists? So the group that was lower than cockroaches and head lice and nickelback scored higher than lobbyists. So this is why it's so much more important than me being on the Hill to have you guys on the Hill and talking to your legislators and your representatives. Um, uh, AOPA is a trusted voice on the Hill. They, uh, they, they trust what we're saying. They know that we're serving our profession and they know how important our profession
profession is, and we'll talk about that later. Uh, but they also need to hear from you as the people that are out there doing this work for a living. That is vital. Um, so if we have this mistrust of lobbyists, what do we do instead? Uh, we do grassroots. So as you see, more and more organizations are relying on their grassroots advocates to get the word out and to talk about the importance of their issues. Um, it takes more than just one lobbyist in DC to do this. Um, and so that's where you come in and that's why we're having this policy forum. And that's why uh, hopefully uh, we'll have all of you on the Hill at some point, if not this year, then next year, uh, talking to your legislators about this. Not that this all needs to be done on the Hill. And we'll talk about that too. Um, because they wanna hear from you. They wanna hear from constituents. This is some polling that was done, I think two years ago, asking uh, uh, senior managers in congressional office and their male staffers, what's the most important thing to you? If, you? if your boss has a decision to make, if there's a piece of legislation on the floor and your boss doesn't know how to vote on it, um, what's gonna make the most difference? And here you can see that 97% say an in-person uh, visit from their constituent is the most important thing. 46% uh, say it has a lot of positive influence, 51% say it has some influence. Um, obviously, times have changed and we're not doing in-person visits and we're gonna talk about how to advocate online. Um, but uh, when you can, when the world returns to normal, that is by far the most important thing. But again, individualized postal letters, individualized emails, all of these things from constituents are the things that members of Congress wanna hear. A visit from a lobbyist, 82% say it has a lot of or some influence. So hopefully that lets me keep my job. But they still want to hear more from you than they want to hear more from me. The work you do is going to have a huge, huge impact on the work that we do. Um, but again, we can't really do those in-person visits. So here I am last week talking to Mike Thompson. Uh, you'll hear his name again. He's the sponsor of our, our Patient-Centered Care Act. Uh, here's me again talking to Lucy McBath, Stephen Horsford, Colin Allred, and Mark Vesey, four members of Congress. Um, this is the way we're at, we're, we're doing this these days. Um, I am not actually normally in, uh, the, the, the shirt and the suit, um, because, uh, we're all just kind of hanging out at home and talking to each other via Skype, via Zoom and things like that. Um, and that's a strong recommendation to you is, is, is they want to talk to you as well. Um, they're doing as much as they can from home, but the fact is they're observing the same guidelines that we are. And so they're at home trying to talk to their constituents, engage what their constituents are doing. Uh, so it's a great time to make things like this happen with your legislators. Um, and a good way to do that in addition to, uh, um, to Zoom and these in-person meetings, uh, and I wanna stress this, is social media. Um, so this weird thing that you're seeing scroll across your screen, uh, I reached out to a, a friend of mine who's a chief of staff on Capitol Hill. And I said, uh, you know, I wanna talk about the importance of social media to advocacy. And I was wondering if you had like, do you just have guidelines for what your, uh, for what your process is when you get mail uh, in Congress or you get a tweet or you get a phone call? Like, how does that work? Is there just some handwritten notes or like, how, how does that work? Can your comms director send me something? Um, and he looked at me like I was crazy. And he said, do you really wanna see what we go through uh, just for one piece of communication? And I said, sure. And he sent me this um, and I couldn't, fit it on one slide. I literally had to create a GIF to fit it all because it's such an arduous process of how they respond to their constituents. Um, it's good because they've clearly uh, finessed this and honed this to a point where uh, they know how to respond to their constituents and it means you get good constituent services. Um, but it's kind of chaotic. Um, the one I want to point your attention to once we jump back to the beginning of this is down here. Um, and I'm gonna point it out for a reason that might be hard to read, so I'm going to read it to you. Um, but down here is social media. And it's a very short, sweet uh, timeline that we've got here compared to the other ones. But I wanna point this one out right here as it moves along. This one says, member drafts their own response. Nowhere else on your list, on this crazy chart that I'm showing you right now, will there, have, will there be a member uh, drafting their own response? That is because every single member of the House, the Senate, and every single governor is on social media. Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, all of them, I think, now are on uh, uh, Instagram. Not that you can really use that for advocating, um, but they're all on there. And they all want to hear from you. And they all have comms directors and uh, senior staff that are monitoring all of this stuff. So at the end of our presentation today, we're all going to go on. Uh, hopefully, we're all going to go on. I would ask you to, to stay on and help us out with this. We're going to send an email uh, or a tweet to our member of Congress in support of our issues. So if you're not using social media now, I hope that this serves as an impetus to do it. Um, this is another way of looking at it. When you send an email or a snail mail, the intern, front desk guy gets it, then it's going to go to somebody called the legislative correspondent. Their job is literally to answer the mail. 
So if they have a response already written to something that you've asked, um, they're just going to kind of rejigger that response and email it or, or mail it back to you. Um, it will probably never get to the desk of the member of Congress. You send, you pick up the phone and call them. That's huge. As you saw on that chart earlier, they want constituent phone calls, but that's probably going to go to, again, the intern of the front desk. Then it's going to go to the health staff, or maybe it'll go to, uh, you know, the, what they, maybe it'll go to the legislative correspondent because they have maybe already heard about this issue. They've crafted a response so they can call you back and give you an answer. When you tweet at them, this is going to go to the communications director, the chief of staff. The member themselves is very likely going to see it. And it's also going to be seen by the general public, your followers. And if the member of Congress responds to it on Twitter or retweets it, then their audience is going to see it too. It's, it creates a much better two-way street, albeit in 280 characters, than you would get uh, from either the email or the phone call. Not saying those don't work. They very much do. And of course, that in-person visit is always going to be the most important thing. But those tweets, that social media, hugely, hugely important for keeping uh, your member of Congress aware of the issues that we're working on. Uh, so I do want to emphasize that you use that as a tool if you haven't done so already. Um, you've heard enough from me. I'm going to pause there uh, and see if you have any questions uh, before I introduce uh, Terry Cuffle, our next speaker. So I'm going to ask Ashley if anybody has weighed in with any questions or if they have questions now. We don't have any content specific questions um, yet. That's why. Um, so let's talk about how to be an effective advocate. Um, and now I want to introduce uh, one of our, I hope is by far one of our best advocates, and that's Terry Cuffle. So Terry is the uh, president and founding co-owner at Arise Orthotics and Prosthetics, where she controls all practice management aspects of the business. Uh, she serves on the board of the Minnesota Society of Orthotists, Prosthetists, and Paradothists, uh, sorry, Paradothetists, and teaches for the master's program uh, in prosthetics and orthotics at Concordia University and Century College. She's also involved with patient help organizations and sits on the board of Minnesota's amputee nonprofit, Wiggle Your Toes. Terry has been an AOPA state representative for nine years and has worked on many state issues, including Minnesota's recently passed OMP licensure laws. Terry was one of the recipients of AOPA's 2015 uh, Ronnie Snell Legislative Advocacy Award uh, for her relentless advocacy of work with uh, MSOPP and AOPA, and we're hugely grateful for that, uh, including participation in numerous uh, policy forums. Um, maybe not quite like uh, this policy forum, because I don't think we've ever seen a policy forum like this one. Um, and she brings patients with her every year, which is also a huge, huge uh, benefit uh, and great, great for us. So with that, I will turn it over to Terry. Uh, and I'm going to run Terry's slides. So if you keep, if you hear her telling me to move the slides, apologize for that, but that's the way we're working our slides today. So Terry. Okay, thank you. Uh, Justin, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay, super. All right. So, uh, greetings and thank you to Justin. Uh, it is my pleasure and it is quite an honor for me to be with you today, uh, albeit virtually. I will admit that I am desperately missing my trips to DC this time of year. The cherry blossoms, seeing so many of you in person, and uh, we are just going to make the best of it this year. Uh, we have condensed a full day of what we normally do um, as, with regard to our presentations into just a few hours. So you'll bear with us as we just go through these as quickly as we can. So we get uh, lots of content to you. And most importantly, we talk about ONP advocacy and uh, the advantages and the effectiveness of it. I do want to take a quick second to congratulate Justin for being with AOPA for just over a year now. Uh, it's been an incredible year and Justin has had quite an impact on the legislative front for AOPA. So thank you to Justin. Thank uh, you. So with regard, Yes, thank you, Justin. ONP advocacy and the value of in-person meetings. Uh, Justin had a slide up and it is a tried and true reality that in-person visits from constituents are the most influential way to communicate with a member of Congress who is undecided on an issue. So these are very important meetings. They are purposeful meetings, uh, in, whether they are in person, face-to-face, uh, -face, or face-to-face -face virtually. They provide a chance for us to educate, to advocate, to build relationships, to establish credibility, to enable access, and ultimately influence decisions. Go ahead, Justin. So virtual ONP advocacy, a little bit different, um, but the same content. Lots of great value in in-person communication uh, via uh, our virtual methods. Congress needs to hear 
our voices, especially during now this unprecedented national quarantine. Now is the time to advocate virtually. If you can, via your home phone, your cell phone, your computer, uh, any way you can. Justin? So the advantages of virtual advocacy. Uh, we have heard that nonprofit organizations are utilizing these electronic communication channels and they are actively advocating. And the advantages include it's affordable. It's a lot more affordable for us to sit in our homes and do this rather than get on a plane and go, have all the rest of the expenses. Uh, it reaches a wide audience and there is so much more information available today to the public than ever before. Lots of advantages. So forms of virtual communication, uh, some of the obvious we've talked about, Justin had up on a slide, the phone calls, the emails. Uh, and these phone calls and emails can be to legislators, uh, to staff, to uh, those who elected officials in our own states as well, uh, to governors, attorneys generals, and all of their staff members. Uh, there's live online meetings such as Zoom or uh, Google or Skype meetings, et cetera. Uh, you can develop online community networks or on platforms, including social networking sites as Facebook, MySpace, Twitter, et cetera. Also, you can create online blogging websites for community networking on customized websites of the associations. <clears throat> Go ahead. The effectiveness of virtual advocacy. So what we are hearing from the Capitol is they have enjoyed well-organized and focused telephone and video meetings. So don't let your inability to advocate in person hinder your ability to make your voice heard. We can do this virtually. Go ahead. Next slide. How can we be effective with OMP virtual advocacy? So it is, uh, it is our intention to be purposeful when we advocate on behalf of our community. It is a community that greatly needs us. So as OMP business leaders, practitioners, administrators, device users, friends, family members, we together will be effective with our virtual advocacy. And how will we do this? By taking some of what we already know works, what we have done for years and incorporating some new strategies into them. Go ahead. So uh, virtual advocacy tells us that we should prepare and gather information, uh, request a meeting, prepare for the meeting, plan for the virtual advocacy visit, uh, send any leave behind papers, any materials, send them early, and then also arrive early. Plan to start your meeting, be present before it starts. Go ahead. And we make our voices heard. How do we do that? When we're in a small group, uh, or if it's just individual one-on-one, -on -one, we introduce ourselves. We always start with a thank you to the member of Congress for seeing with us or the staff member. Uh, and we present the legislative ask. We always remember to say please and thank you. Common courtesies go such a long way in this environment. Um, always remember to present leave behind materials, your one pager. Uh, AOPA usually has a file full of information. So whatever that material is uh, virtually, your documents you send uh, ahead of time. Really important to share your story and express why action on a particular issue is important to you to your family member, to your patients, to your friends. Uh, important to ask questions and really listen to the answers, write down the answers uh, to see where it leads to the next step. Uh, be sure to repeat your ask a few times. Uh, always say thank you again and again, and really important to follow up in three to five days after you've had your virtual visit. And we remember our three keywords that we have talked about, I have presented for the last several years, our three free, three free words, educate, advocate, access. And this year we have no fear of the elevator. We talk about an elevator speech. We talk about what if you get caught in the elevator with a congressperson, what do you say? Do you freeze up? Well, if you remember these three words, educate, advocate, and access, that will help. So we can, we remember these words while we're advocating virtually as well. Educate, we need to educate our legislators, their staff, about the OMP issues that are important to us. Not just us, our friends, our family members, all of us in our community. Next. Advocate, 
So it is so important. We are educating and we are advocating on behalf of those who have limb loss or limb impairment, limb differences. Again, our patients, our friends, family members, our community. Next. And why do we do both? We educate and access with a purpose. We have intention behind what we are doing to provide access for our patients to orthotic and prosthetic care and devices. So what we are going to do today in a condensed version, we're gonna take a moment to review what we have done in the past and remember what it takes to be an effective advocate. And we're gonna talk about this. This can be done both at the federal and at the state level. We have talked in the past about a five-step how-to advocacy plan. And I will bring it forward again because it's very basic uh, and it really hits all the main points. We've got some pictures here on several of the next slides showing you some, uh, in, some of my advocacy and some of my friends' advocacy uh, activities over the years, uh, over the past 10 years, by the way. Uh, we do have Senator Tammy Duckworth uh, in that top picture with Rob Rickenberg and I, and that was taken, I would say, about five years ago. Justin, could you co go back for a second? Thanks. So we're going to talk about the five steps again. I will say them and then we'll go through them. Uh, laying the foundation, rallying the troops, repeating the message, establishing that relationship, and following up quickly, repeatedly, and consistently. Now, thank you. So laying the foundation. Really important to educate ourselves on the pertinent issues. Uh, Justin and Joe will be going through our specific issues today, the bills. Uh, Kat will be with us as well, speaking to several issues that we need to communicate virtually to our Congress people about uh, today and over the next week or so. It's easy to review any of the materials that AOPA gives you. Also, the Academy, NAOP, ABC, BOC, AC, they all have materials that are pertinent to our issues, things that are important to our community now. Become that expert on topic. Uh, prior to your visit, find out who's in the office and call or write before you come. Go ahead. So rallying the troops. I have talked in the past about the trifecta, having a trifecta of people, one person, three people, 10 people. Uh, make sure we have someone who can speak to policy, someone who can speak as a practitioner or to the issues that are affecting the, our patients or device users. Uh, and also if you can have someone who actually wears a device with you, uh, it's amazing the difference in the conversation, uh, how it starts, where it goes and how it ends. Uh, one of the top pictures to the right uh, is one of my favorite pictures because we had such incredible representation that year. We have Michelle Hall from the Academy, who was the Academy president. I am pictured and represented AOPA. Eli is in front, who is a prosthetic patient. Senator Amy Klobuchar is in the back. We were visiting her. Eli's dad, Rich, is a veteran. He's very concerned about how he will provide for Eli and Eli's future. Uh, Beth uh, was a student representing Minnesota, and Charlie is there representing NCOPE. Minnesota usually has a showing of about six to eight people each year, uh, and I know we have more than that on the phone today, so thank you for all joining me. And uh, we've just got some great industry reps, and we have made a concerted effort to be present as uh, advocates for our community. The lower picture is a representation of the Minnesota Dream Team in front of HHS in 2015. Next slide. So how to rally your troops, how to do it. Who do you know in your state OMP community? Do you have a state group? Uh, do you have nonprofit groups? Uh, how can you get them to join you? Uh, which patients? might be interested and which patients might be a good advocate. Uh, in the past 10 years that I have come to visit uh, DC, make these visits for the Amputee Coalition and for AOPA, I have um, more often brought patients that are not patients of Arise, uh, my company. Uh, we have a very extended community of people who care about these issues and have made a concerted effort. And these are just some pictures of some of the visits along the way. Next. 
So repeating the message. So create a simple message. Uh, give your white paper or your leave behind a one pager. AOPA has been really great about always being able to provide that for us. And when you're together in a group, share the delivery of the message. Uh, there's an old advertising adage that says it takes about seven times in seven different ways to get your point across. So know that if you say it once or twice, it's probably not going to stick. You really have to keep at it. Uh, and don't forget the ask in your message when you're there virtually, when you're talking to someone, uh, and also in your print. Remember, we are there to ask for something. Ask for a vote. Ask for a letter. Ask them to pen a letter. Ask for their support. Ask for their help. What I like to ask them always uh, is if you hear anything about healthcare, about assistive technology, about orthotics and prosthetics specifically, please think of our community, please think of me, please call me. Next slide. So how can you share that message? Uh, if you're an individual, you've got a lot uh, at task. If you're in a group, then it's easier to have. If you have a patient with you, someone who wears a device, uh, that person can speak first. Usually really sets the tone of the meeting, uh, share his or her story, use visual aids. Uh, if there's a practitioner present, the practitioner can speak to the OMP issue related to the patient. How his care may be compromised, because of an issue uh, or how reimbursement uh, may be compromised. Uh, make sure there's someone there to speak about policy, the policy points specifically provided by AOPA. Uh, if there's a student, uh, such a fabulous uh, addition to our policy forums over the last four or five years uh, to have the influx of students with us. Uh, really, they have been a great source to help bring to life uh, the grants needed for education initiatives. And veterans, we have had the great um, fortune to have probably four or five different veterans walk with us over the past uh, 10 years in Minnesota, and that really sheds a lot of light on the VA issues. I believe Kat will speak to those later. Okay, next slide. And the KISS mentality implies. Um, so uh, keep it simple. So as these uh, posters say, simple concepts, make sure your message is simple um, and you're getting it across. Okay. Number four, establish the relationship. Uh, I use these two pictures purposefully. Uh, Representative Tom Emmer is pictured above in the middle and below um, on the left-hand side. So Tom Emmer is someone who uh, Rob Rickenberg and I visited in Minnesota at the state level. He was a state rep about 11 or 12 years ago when we were working our insurance uh, fairness or parity bill and our O&P licensure bill. And Tom Emmer remembered us. And he remembered us because he and Rob were both from Delano, small town Minnesota. And so they really hit it off. So these are just over the last couple of years, we've been able to reconnect with Congressman Emmer and it has been very advantageous to us. Uh, he remembers us, he remembers our community. Uh, we can reach out. I have the cell phone connection to his, his chief of staff and uh, it is really nice to have that connection. And it's been, that has been more than 10 years established. So make that impression, um, find some common ground, um, any which way it is, if there's an aunt, if there's a babysitter, if there's a high school that you have a connection to, if there's an eating establishment, something back home. Uh, that is why we uh, work with you on your, in particular, uh, districts so you have common ground and you can share that common ground. After several visits with these people over the years you will have established some pretty incredible relationships and uh, they're ones that uh, can be very fruitful going forward. Okay. Finding your common ground. Networking 101. Connecting those dots. Uh, these pictures, we have uh, Congressman Eric Polson on the top, and we worked with Congressman Polson uh, for about, I would say, six or seven years. Aaron Holm is pictured all the way to the right on the top, and he and Congressman Polson um, have become very good friends over the years. In fact, such good friends that Congressman Polson asked Eric Aaron to be uh, in his reelection campaign. Minnesota is a hotbed for medical devices. So you can see the connections that were made, the connecting the dots. In the lower picture, unfortunately, Congressman Polson is no longer at 
D in DC for, and does not represent our community anymore. However, Congressman Dean Phillips does. He's pictured below somewhere in the center. And to his left is Chris Dunn. The two of them really hit it off at our meeting last year. And it has been an incredible uh, relationship that was quickly established. Uh, Chris is a veteran and Congressman Dean uh, Phillips is very interested in helping serve him and this community. Their connection was based on an eating establishment and uh, a, a local high school. So who do you know? Who do you know who knows someone? Establish the familiarity you have with family, friends, with places, with foods, with eateries, with sports teams, etc. Next slide and follow up. It is so important to follow up with phone calls, letters, emails. Keep consistent communication to maintain that connection. Invite our legislators to your ONP facilities, uh, to meetings, make local visits in your home states. Now up above, we have Rob with Senator Amy Klobuchar. We asked her to join us at a fundraising event we had for Wiggle Your Toes, and she came. So did the media. It was great for her, it was great for us. We maintain that connection and have done so with her for about 12 years now. Uh, the lower picture is uh, Rob and I visiting Senator Al Franken uh, in Minnesota on one of our trips. So making sure to make those local visits in your home state, make sure you get on email lists, always use your common courtesies, your pleases and thank yous. Next. So the importance of state, state ONP groups. Uh, if you have an ONP state group, uh, if you are affiliated with one, um, fantastic. If you're not, join one. If you don't have one, start one. You will find people with common interests and these people will find one another together. You'll have renewed strength in numbers to join forces. You also find that your advocacy work together could turn into policy writing, could make a real impact on in your state, in the ONP environment. It is valuable and it is necessary for our ONP industry. And, find, and as you do this, you just might find a little bit of yourself as you give back in your time, your talents, and your treasures. Go ahead. So this, this slide, sorry for all the characters, um, but this was about 10 slides worth of information. So I'm just gonna hit on these bullets. Minnesota has had some pretty incredible results from our effective advocacy work, including um, 10 full years of successful visits, both at the state and the national level. We've established some incredible relationships with some important people in our state and at the national level. Uh, we have had news articles published about our journeys. Uh, we have had letters penned by important people to important people, our legislators. And most importantly, we have been a very um, integral part of making change in our state, making changes in fee schedules, making changes in prior authorization policies and coverage criteria, and even changing the law. So we have passed uh, the OMP licensure law, which was effective 1-1-18. Uh, the fee schedule changes that we have been a part of changing over the years include Medicaid and private sector, and also changing prior authorization coverage criteria also with Medicaid and private sector. Next slide. So you will find out, I'm absolutely confident, how amazing it is to be a part of OMP Grassroots Advocacy, how amazing your efforts can be, whether they are virtual or in person. They are educational, they are effective, they are essential to our profession, and they are just downright extraordinary, just like the people we serve. Now, do we have? Take it off mute there and see if uh, there are any yeah. questions for Terry as we await uh, the arrival of Senator Duckworth. We do have a couple of questions. Um, so going back to the social media um, plug that you made, Justin, is there a sure. preferred social media um, platform for congressional members? I would say Twitter is probably the one they use most often. Um, a lot of them, certainly on the Republican side, have followed the lead of the president, and that's sort of how they get their messages out there. Um, but increasingly, they just find it to be much more of a two-way street. You'll find on Instagram, it's, you know, I, I opened this factory today, or I attended this uh, farmer's market, et cetera, et cetera. So that's, that's what we use Instagram for, right? So that's what they're using Instagram for. YouTube is their floor speeches and speeches they've made out in public. Um, 
Facebook also, a lot of them will disable comments on Facebook to kind of keep things to a minimum. Uh, but with Twitter, you can't do that. So it, it's very much a two-way street. So I would say Twitter fills that role. Um, uh, I would, even if you're not uh, going to interact with your legislators uh, on Twitter, I would suggest that you uh, follow Chuck Grassley of Iowa because he clearly writes his own tweet, tweets. And even after all these years, he's not terribly good at it. So there's, he'll literally tweet something like, this tweet is for Joe Smith of Ames, Iowa. And you're like, that's not how this works. So uh, <laughs> even if you're not going to, even if you're not going to interact with him, but uh, Twitter is the answer to that question. Okay, great. Um, I'm actually not seeing any new questions here. Um, so um, we are. So I'll just, I'll take a minute to amplify some of what Terry said, because it's always so great. Uh, and that is, uh, and one of them is that you, the more you do this, uh, and I don't mean coming to DC, I just mean the more that you advocate in general, the more you'll be seen as a resource by these legislators. Um, that's just not on the uh, federal level, as Terry knows well, it's also on the state level. So I used to do state level government relations, um, and we did a, uh, a lobby day in Illinois, uh, so I, or mid 2000s, I suppose, I suppose, uh, when Tammy Duckworth was, was uh, still uh, serving in Iraq. And uh, I was talking to the chair of the health, the Senate Health Committee there, the, the Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions Committee. And the legislator said to me, how long have you been doing this? Uh, and we said, well, this is our first one. He's like, well, if you were here literally last year, you wouldn't be talking to me. You'd be talking to Barack Obama, who literally sat in his chair. So that's how fast Obama skyrocketed. One year, he was the chair of this committee in Illinois. And then the next year, he was in the US Senate. And then, of course, he was the president of the United States. Like there, there are people who can chart a course like that. So doing that level of advocacy and making all the connections that you saw in all of Terry's great pictures, uh, it pays off in the long run because most of these folks aren't going away. Um, so establish those relationships. Um, Terry, anything yeah. else? To oh, sorry, is Ashley, was that Ashley? Yeah, sorry, we do have a few more questions here. Um, okay, great. Uh, this is uh, one from Christine Camilo. She says, I was able to attend AOPA Policy Forum one year and was provided with prepared sheets of information to present. Will we be getting those uh, during this event? During this event, no, but uh, we are doing that a little different. So at the end of this event, you'll be taken to our website. You won't be taken to, I'll be asking you to go to our website where you'll see pre-written uh, letters to our members of Congress. Um, and so those will serve as kind of your talking points and, the, and your way to guide you forward on these policy decisions. I can certainly send more information to anybody who wants it. My email address will be up several times throughout our presentation. Um, so if you want talking points kind of tailored, we can absolutely do that. Uh, but because we're not in person this year, we're doing and we're doing digital. We'll we'll have all that online. So I guess yes is in a weird way the answer to your question. Great. Um, and we have a couple questions about uh, what's coming up. Um, so I'm gonna I I just will hold those until we get to the next section after uh, Senator sure. Duckworth. Sure, I have no doubt that people have lots of questions about the Paycheck Protection Program and and uh, the provider relief program through HHS. So we'll be covering a lot of that, but we'll also leave time for questions because I know folks will have a lot of time, uh, a, a lot of questions about those things. So um, we can either forge forward or Terry, is there anything you wanted to add that you didn't think you would have time to get to? Uh, one more question. Okay. Who, who, is the Iowa, who is the Iowa person that you um, said everyone? Yep. Senator That's Chuck Grassley. Um, if, you, if you look at his Twitter, it's, um, it's a different use of medium, let's put it that way. <laughs> yeah, and I don't have anything else to add. I'm, if there are questions, let us know. So we'll Thank you all. Yeah, absolutely. So, so we'll double, uh, we'll double back to Senator Duckworth's introduction uh, when she is able to join us. As folks know, I mean, things on the Hill, especially now, are are extraordinarily chaotic, and so. Um, we anticipate that she'll be on any minute, but we will forge ahead um, and come back. So I did want to talk about the key legislation that we are working on um, and that we will be working on for the rest of this congressional session. Um, it splits kind of into four different categories, but uh, uh, two of these are, well, three of these really are heavily related. So I want to quickly go over what has been done uh, in terms of COVID legislation to date. Uh, I do want to talk about the Orthotics and Prosthetics Patient Center Care Act, which is the big piece of legislation that we're trying to move this year. 
Um, but we're also, as Jeff alluded to at the beginning of our, uh, at the kickoff of our event here, we're trying to move a portion of that into the COVID-4 bill. Um, and that is happening literally right now as we speak. So uh, we'll get to that. And then finally, wanted to end with the Wounded Warrior Workforce Enhancement Act. That's a bill that uh, folks who have uh, done advocacy for, AOP, for AOPA have seen before. Um, but we are ending this Congress uh, by taking a very different uh, tack with it. Um, and I'm sure Senator Duckworth will talk about that when she's on. But uh, the thing we need to emphasize when it comes to COVID is the P&O businesses are considered essential healthcare businesses. You're allowed to be open. You're allowed to keep uh, doing your work. I'm sure this is by now not a surprise to any of you. Um, and the work that we're doing is extraordinarily vital. Um, and we know that you are out there doing it. So many, many folks have sent in pictures and stories um, about the work that they're doing and how it, how it goes on. Uh, we are greatly appreciative of that. Members of Congress want to see this. Um, it is... Uh, great to show this to our elected officials to say hey we know that things are different but we're still out there doing the work these things have to get done kids still need cranial their cranial health is adjusted we still need to go uh we still need to be doing our rehab and things like that so by all means my email address is there on the screen if you have photos or stories uh of anybody uh, of this work please do send that to us we would love to be able to share it with your member of congress and other members of congress uh it really does make the case um for us so please do share those um, I do want to take a quick moment for another poll question, um, since we're talking about being essential businesses and still being open. Um, here you see the question on the screen, considering the COVID-19 pandemic, which response best describes the current status of your business? So I see that that poll is open, so we'll give everybody just a minute to um, answer that. And then we will go into some more detail on uh, what's been done in Congress so far on COVID. I'm sure Senator Duckworth will uh, have some things to say about that as well. So we'll give everybody just a minute. I'm just now getting an email, just so folks know from the Senator's scheduler. Uh, there is a vote at two uh, that conflicts with her start time. So she will still uh, we'll get her, it'll just be a few minutes late, she said. So. So glad that we have soldiered on now knowing that. Yeah, so we, we only have about 35% voted, so I'm gonna leave it open for a few more seconds. And for those of you that are, are joining us, um, if you're not able, if you are able to see the poll, please answer it on the screen if you can. It is in progress, so you should be able to to answer it directly yeah. um, in the poll. So we do we do have some some people that are unable to um, answer it directly in the poll, but we're collecting those answers that you all are sharing. Um, with us. Um, so it, those of you that are sharing in chat or in the question um, section, we will we will collect those as well. Um, with 44, I'm going to go ahead and close the poll now. Thanks, Ashley. And, no problem. And I'm sharing the results you'll see here on the screen with 44% voting. 31% um, uh, say that we are open for business and fully staffed. 44% say we are open for business with some impacts on staffing. 23% say we are operating at a limited capacity and 1% we have temporarily closed our business. Excellent. Thank you for sharing that information. It's greatly uh, appreciated and um, helps us share that information on the Hill and certainly uh, fosters our belief that folks aren't shutting down in this. Uh, we, we can't, the work that you do is too important. Um, so getting back to, to what's going on in Congress, uh, so far three, uh, you could say three and a half bills have been passed. So. Um, talking directly about, uh, we'll be talking more about phase three and phase three B. Uh, phase three was the CARES Act, and we'll be talking more about that. That's where a lot of the, the well, all of the money for uh, this, the first economic stimulus came from, where the provider relief funds came from. Uh, and the second part of that was an additional $310 billion. So uh, phase four, we'll be talking about a little bit as well. Uh, that is in the process of being written. Um, we have, there's another bill being written right now, mainly in the House. Uh, that is going to be a little bit more of a catch-all bill. There still will be a lot of economic support. Um, 
So uh, I'm going to tell my staff real quick that uh, Senator Duckworth's scheduler has said that the link is not working uh, for her. So um, if they could just send her another link or try to figure out how to get her on, that would be awesome. So quick message to my staff. Apologies for that. Uh, getting back to this slide. So um, Pelosi is uh, kind of opened this up to a little bit more uh, of a widespread look at these things um, uh, and how they're going to work. So uh, there could be any number of things in this bill, and we're going to talk about one of the things that we're, we hope to see uh, in there as well. Uh, so again, uh, phase three was the CARES Act. Let's talk about that. Um, 15 billion in stimulus payments uh, directly to fee-for-service entities. Um, 30 billion of that was distributed a few weeks ago, and I know we worked with a lot of members uh, to make sure that they received that money. Uh, either as a direct deposit or as a check that they got later. Um, 20 billion has been, uh, we'll talk about that in a second, uh, it has been started to be doled out uh, by HHS, uh, but there is an application program for that, so uh, it's a little bit different. Um, and again, uh, small business, the PPP loans, the first bill uh, offered 349 billion. Uh, that unfortunately was all used up in a real hurry. Uh, the second bill passed last week uh, was 321 billion. Uh, which is in the process of being doled out. Uh, there was a couple of other uh, facets to that bill that we'll talk about in just one second. Um, so let's talk about the Paycheck Protection Loans first. Um, I know a lot of people have uh, either gotten or applied for those. Um, we have a separate webinar that AOPA has done on these loans uh, that you can go onto our, AO our, our um, COVID resources page and look at. We have a very robust COVID resources page for our, uh, our members and non-members alike. So please do go check that out. One of the things you'll find on there is a webinar specifically about that first CARES Act. Um, again, and I think this is important, the SBA will forgive those loans if uh, you keep folks on the payroll uh, for eight weeks, if you use the money for basically anything to keep your doors open, payroll, rent, mortgage interest, any of those things, uh, that loan will be forgiven. Um, there is another round, and I say on this slide uh, that the second round is expected to be used up shortly. Um, it is already in the process of being doled out. So if you are in the pipeline for that second uh, uh, round of 310 billion, uh, well, if you're not in there, please get in there sooner than later, uh, because given how fast the first round of money went away, uh, we sure as heck don't want that to happen to the next round of money if you are hoping to get some. Um, a little bit more on the Paycheck Protection Program. Again, that first round was 484, the second was 310. Um, they say that the first round supported over 1.66 small, uh, 1.66 million small businesses, but of course there was a lot of blowback in terms of who is getting that money. Uh, Shake Shack gave theirs back, Harvard is keeping theirs. Uh, there is, uh, I think, one uh, member of Congress who oversees, uh, 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 oversees a, an owner of uh, a bunch of factory farms, uh, and one of his farms received some of this money, so that was uh, not seen exactly correctly. So. Increased oversight with the second round will probably be the name of the game. That wouldn't affect us too much. In fact, it benefits us having increased oversight of this. Um, and the the only thing that will probably affect us in any way is that there will be monthly reports published to uh, say exactly where this money is going. They are trying to increase the transparency of this, which makes sense. Um, there was also the provider relief fund. So uh, you've also heard about this. Uh, AOPA has sent out emails uh, on this as well. The first round of $30 billion was sent via direct deposit or paper check. We were honestly not sure we would be included in that first round. We had, did not get uh, confirmation from HHS that we were deemed essential enough to get that. Uh, we certainly fought hard enough to make it happen. Uh, but as it turns out, we were in that uh, first round. Um, the second round, which is probably more relevant news to folks out there, is available now. So there's 20 million more dollars available under that same provider relief fund. Uh, this is also a grant. This is not, does not, assuming you're using it uh, for the purposes outlined, does not need to be paid back. But there is an application process uh, with this second uh, round of money. Um, you have to go on this website that you see on your screen, hhs.gov slash provider relief, um, and you'll fill out uh, some forms. You'll have to have some uh, uh, paperwork uh, at the ready just so you're able to fill it out but there is an FAQ on that page uh, which will get you help you collect everything that you need at the outset of applying for that second set of funds. HHS is recommending that if you received money in the first round that you apply for the second round so it's not going to be a case where they're going to say well you got it in the first round why are you asking for more they are telling people if you got it in the first really of course it makes sense because if you got it in the first round that's the actual only way to be eligible to get the second round if you didn't get it in the first round um it's a little bit of a different application process um so again grants that do not need to be paid back um 
So I would recommend uh, going on that website and getting some more information. There are FAQs on there, but again, if you've got that first round of funding, please do look into that second round of funding. Um, I'm gonna open this up for another poll question, uh, which is a good time for, I don't know why this is fading in and out like that, sorry. Um, um, but I want to. I want. I would like to know uh, those on the call. Have you received for? Uh, have you received or even applied for any of these uh, COVID nineteen programs? So we will open up that poll. And Ashley, let me know when it's up. Yep. Oh, the poll's open. We've got um, eleven percent voted so far. So the the answers are coming in. And we are working to get Senator Duck with the link to get her on the call. I'm not sure why that person didn't work, but the thrill of live television, I guess. Justin, we do have some some questions in the in the box too. Would you like me to hold those until after? No, you can. Let's, let's 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 get those going. That would be great. Okay. So while the poll is up, um, we have a couple of uh, um, questions here that are related to what you're talking about right now. So, um, what does AOPA leadership feel are the hot button issues coming out of the crisis? Well, I certainly don't. Sorry, I, I certainly don't want to speak for AOPA leadership. Um, but uh, I, you know, it's it's keeping our doors open. I would view as the as probably the most uh, important thing. We want to make sure that uh, our folks are able to pay their uh, uh, employees, that they're able to keep their employees on the roll, that they're able to stay open in a healthy manner, not only for themselves but for their patients. Um, so from the outset of this, uh, that is certainly what our staff has been doing. Has been just making sure that we uh, are included in any talks of you know, the paycheck protection, uh, that first round of provider relief, just making sure that our folks had access to those funds. Uh, that was the most important thing for us. Hi everyone, it's Tammy Duckworth. How are you? Can you guys see me? Hey, there you are. <laughs> hey, Senator, how are you? How are y'all? Good, sorry Hello, for the Senator technical Duckworth. issues. Um, so I am going to kick this back uh, to this slide and let uh, Terry Cuffle, one of our board members, introduce you, Senator Duckworth. Okay. Hello, Senator Duckworth. Thank, thank you so much for joining us. I would like to formally introduce you. So Senator Tammy Duckworth is an Iraq War veteran, Purple Heart recipient, and former Assistant Secretary of the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs. She served in the reserve forces for 23 years before retiring at the rank of Lieutenant Colonel in 2014. In 2004, Senator Duckworth was deployed to Iraq as a Black Hawk helicopter pilot for the Illinois Army National Guard. In November of that year, her helicopter was hit by an RPG and she lost her legs and partial use of her right arm. Senator Duckworth spent the next year recovering at Walter Reed Army Medical Center, where she quickly became an advocate for her fellow soldiers. After she recovered, she became director of the Illinois Department of Veterans Affairs, where she helped create a tax credit for employers that hire veterans. She established a first in the nation 24 seven veterans crisis hotline and developed innovative programs to improve veterans access to housing and health care. In 2009, President Obama appointed Senator Duckworth as an assistant secretary of veterans affairs, where she coordinated a joint initiative with the US Department of Housing and Urban Development to help end veteran homelessness, worked to address the unique challenges faced by females as well as Native American veterans and created the Office of Online Communications to improve the VA's accessibility. In the Senate, Senator Duckworth advocates for practical common sense solutions needed to move our country forward. Throughout her career in public service, she has been a consistent advocate for orthotics and prosthetics in our profession. We're honored to be joined today by Senator Tammy Duckworth. Welcome. Hi, thank you so much. I'm sorry I'm running late. I had votes, so um, uh, I'm so glad to be joining everybody here. It's a real honor um, uh, to be invited by AOPA to join you guys and, and have this conversation today. Um, there are so many Americans that count on each of you to give them the tools that they need to live their daily lives and be their own productive selves. Um, and you know, some of you have heard my story before, but the, the key part of the story that I want to chat with you and, and why I'm so dedicated to supporting AWPA here on Capitol Hill is because of what your members have done for me 
is like so many Americans who suddenly wake up uh, confronting limb loss. Um, when I woke up at Walter Reed, a couple of things had already happened. One, the surgeon had already approached my husband saying that because I only had about an inch of femur left that um, he should make the decision to go ahead and make me a hip dysartic. Um, that the, what was left of my limb was gonna be useless uh, and that uh, it was better and much more kind to have the surgery while I was unconscious and before I woke up um, uh, than it was to ask me to make that decision. And he fought them and he said, no, I know my wife, if there's any opportunity for her to walk, walk on that leg, she will figure out a way to do it. And she would wanna make this decision herself. And um, so he fought them off. But then when I did wake up, that was one of the first questions that I had, that I was asked was, which was, you know, all you've got is that ball joint. You've got like maybe an inch, an inch and a half of bone. Um, it's just going to atrophy, be in the way. Let's just take it out now. Um, and I asked the doctor to give me a couple of days to think about it. And a couple of days later, in the middle of the night, in the depths of despair, because I wanted to rejoin my army unit, I wanted to go back and fly my helicopter again, like every other American soldier. I wanted to go back to my unit. Um, in walks Dennis Clark. Dennis Clark walks into my uh, into my hospital room, literally in the middle of the night, because in those days he was there from dawn to dusk and well into the evenings, working and helping each one of us, flying out from Iowa on a Monday, taking care of us, flying home on a Thursday night or a Friday morning, building our sockets in his home workshop in Iowa, and then getting back on a flight uh, after the weekend, uh, carrying, hand carrying all of our sockets back with him on the flight on Monday. And he did that um, for years. But in the middle of the night, Dennis came into me in my office, into my, I'm sorry, into my room and said, you know, let me chat with you about what's ahead. Your life's gonna be normal, everything's gonna be fine. You'll be able to do all these things. And I said, well, here's the decision I have to make. And he really listened to me and listened to what I was trying to get across, which was, it wasn't just about having a regular life. I wanted my army life back. Um, and he said something at the time when I was in the depths of despair that was just a thread of hope, but that thread was a real lifeline to me. What he said was, well, if you're willing to let me try, and if you're willing to let me fail, then we can go on this journey together and I will try to find a way to fit you as an AK. I will try to find a way um, to help you maximize what limb you have left and uh, help you towards your goal of being able to fly again. And that thread of hope that he gave me was literally a lifeline. And what's amazing about that is it's such a typical thing to say about Dennis and we all know Dennis and, and love him, but it's also very typical of the stories I hear from other amputees with their prosthetists, with your members. Time and time again, I've heard from folks who said, you know, uh, I wouldn't be here if it were not for the people making the sockets and then teaching me to walk again and teaching me, um, giving me hope and, and giving me a new life. And, and that's what AOPA members do. So that's why I really am so dedicated to you guys because I simply wouldn't be here in the United States Senate if I had not been given the tools to recover and live my fullest life. And so just as Dennis gave me a mission when I needed the most, he helped me see a path forward and helped me walk down that path. One stumble, <laughs> one fall, one standing back up, one, one painful socket until I got to the uh, socket that felt like I was wearing tennis shoes, uh, my most comfortable tennis shoes and, and, and really soft fuzzy socks, you know? Um, uh, and because of that, we're in this journey together here in Capitol Hill. So. I know that there are so many of you who are all unsung heroes fighting on the front lines of uh, this pandemic as well. Um, and so many of you are trying to help folks, whether it's through uh, telemedicine, whether it is uh, through volunteer work going into hospitals right now in the middle of the pandemic to do what you can do. I just want you to know that I'm with you. And um, so whatever I can do to help, I'm here. And because we are a little bit low on time, I'm gonna shut up and let's go right to the um, question and answer part so that we can um, get as many questions as, as possible. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Senator. And if folks do have questions for the Senator, please submit them the same way that you would uh, for the rest of our webinar and just use the, the little chat box on your screen. Um, and Ashley will be reading our questions for us. Thank you. Great, yes, so our first question, um, what are the next steps Congress will be taking to address the COVID pandemic? 
Well, we are negotiating um, the fourth rescue package. So the big packet that came out um, uh, three, four weeks ago, that was COVID-3. Uh, and that's the one that had the initial um, uh, paycheck protection plan. And it had the $150 billion for hospitals and medical centers, um, had the help with small businesses, which actually didn't get to small businesses, unfortunately. Um, and I, I'm sure many of your members applied, but didn't get the money. Um, so we were in the middle of negotiating um, the CARES package for when um, we found out that a lot of the banks, the large banks were gaming the system and getting their large you know, corporate uh, customers uh, uh, loans in the excess of 10, uh, $15 million, this money that was supposed to go to small businesses. Um, and so we then ahead, stopped negotiating on four and immediately pushed three push through 3.5. So 3.5 put more money into the small business pot, put more money into um, a program that was set aside for minority and women owned businesses. So there, there was 70 billion in that, um, additional 10 billion into the um, economic, economic disaster injury loan program, which is the $10,000 outright grant that you can get. Um, and right now, um, so the next step is right now we're negotiating COVID CARES package four. Um, and that is what's we're, what we're doing here in Capitol Hill right now. Um, and we are, um, that'll be another um, large bill. And, and really the focus on that is to get the funds to more small businesses and more healthcare providers, and then help also to states and municipalities as well. Great, thank you. Um, another question, how can our profession better communicate the unique needs of individuals living with limb loss and limb difference um, and the practitioners that treat them to members of Congress? Um, you know, I think what I've seen AOPA do since I started out in the House, you know, I did four years in the House, I'm in my, my third year here in the Senate. You guys have come a long way in the last five years, let me, you know, five, six years, let me just say that. Um, uh, I think you've become much more engaging with the members and that's really what you need to do. And then what, you, what we were supposed to be doing today, which is a fly-in, uh, uh, was something that is exactly what you needed to be doing, which is sitting down with the members, with the staff members, and um, really bringing your issues to people so that they really understand uh, the challenges and uniqueness that you face. Like I, I don't think that most members understand that um, prostitutes, you know, uh, are, are small business owners, and that you guys are, are carrying the load uh, of, you know, patients. Uh, whose insurance are not paying you on time. And, and many, many um, providers are, you know, carrying loads in excess of a half a million dollars uh, waiting to be paid by, by Medicare or Medicaid or insurance companies. And I don't think they get that, that this is, many of you are small, literally family owned, family run businesses. Um, and, and that is really critical to get that information, um, uh, uh, you know, out to us. And so engaging with us more, um, and maybe we can do more things here on the Hill once things get better. I would recommend you do maybe some demonstrations, that sort of stuff, sitting down in members' offices is one thing, but maybe doing some demonstrations where you show um, people, you know, working and walking and running with, with prosthetics and, and orthotics. And, um, uh, you know, uh, I think it's really great. I'll give you an example. The dermatologists um, run a skin check clinic here once once a, uh, a year and they come in and then if people, if members want to go and, and, and you know, they'll, they'll do a quick skin check and or that sort of stuff. So it's just showing the clinical side of what you do, the technical side of what you do, I think um, the, the person to person side, I think is kind of a nice little hook. So we'll, we'll, we'll work on that moving forward. Great, thank you so much. So I know that you're short with time. I think we've um, received the yellow flag from your staff. Um, so um, there'll be no more questions now, but we'll make sure to share those additional questions that you all um, sent in with um, with the senator's staff. Thank you so much. I'm so sorry that the, the votes, they, I, I don't, you know, it, it's almost like you were here in person the way votes interrupt things. <laughs> <laughs> thank, <laughs> all right, thank, thank you, you everyone. Much. We really appreciate Take it. Care. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Well, excellent. Um, so glad we got to spend some time with her. Um, and it's also always great when the U.S. Senator comes back on and says essentially the same thing that you just said. It's always bad when they contradict everything that you just said. Um, so that's also good. Uh, but we, uh, last I checked, were smack in the middle of a poll. Am I right about that, Ashley? Do we 
Is that yes? So we closed the poll. We closed the poll right, um, right as the senator came on, just because we I didn't know what the functionality would be like if we would lose it. Um, and so I can um, provide the results for that um, with uh, around 30% voting. Um, it looks like 15% have received HHS stimulus, 5% Medicare Advance payment, 45% Paycheck Protection Program, and 35% uh of more more than one of those um have received um stimulus through those excellent excellent good it's good to know that that we're getting that um um and appreciate everybody's answering on that and of course if anybody has uh any questions uh after this uh again my email address will be up again jbland at aopennet.org um please reach out to me to talk more about um, I'm going to, we're going to talk more about veterans issues uh, in the wounded workforce bill in a little bit, but I did want to point out that we achieved another victory in that uh, COVID-3 bill, uh, the CARES Act, uh, where we wanted to make sure uh, that uh, vets continue to have their choice of provider even throughout the pandemic. So uh, I won't leave, read the language on your screen, but you can see it on your screen. Um, this is language that was worked into that CARES Act. because We wanted to make sure uh, that the veterans continuum of care uh, continued unabated. Uh, even throughout this crisis and that they weren't exposed unnecessarily to uh, potential COVID uh, in the care that they were getting. Um, we continue to have uh, access with uh, conversations with VA officials um, about uh, the issues facing uh, veterans access to care, not just during COVID, but in general. Uh, and we'll, uh, you know, th those are conversations that are ongoing. We want to make sure that uh, vets continue to have the choice of who they see. Um, I'm going to pause there uh, before we get into uh, the regulatory side of these things uh, and take some questions on uh, the CARES Act, anything related to that that folks might have. I know there's a lot. I assume there's a lot. <laughs> yes, yes, Justin. So we we had quite a bit um, coming in right before uh, Senator Duckworth, so I'm gonna I'm gonna back back up to some of those. Um, sure. Beyond patient advocacy organizations and practices, um, are there manufacturers participating in our advocacy efforts? Yes, I think uh, you know we have a, a, a good swath of, of advocates that participate, uh, not just from the patient, uh, from the from the practitioner side, but also from the manufacturer side. Uh, AOPA represents both, and we're always sure to represent both when we're on the hill. Um, so I couldn't give you a specific breakdown of the uh, percentages of which advocates are practitioners versus manufacturers, but absolutely, we 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 try to reach out to and involve both audiences as much as we can. Um, Terry, I don't know if you want to add to that. I actually don't see Terry on camera anymore. Uh, well, I'm here. Uh, okay. And yeah, we, absolutely. We have so many manufacturers who are members of AOPA and who participate in the policy forum. And there were several pictures, uh, several present in the pictures that I displayed. Uh, and most uh, significantly, um, Autobach used to be housed in Minnesota. So we had Brad Rule and Kimberly Hansen with us for years. Uh, so, and, and so many more from across the state. Um, and related to a, a previous question um, that um, Brad Rule actually posed about our the leadership and, and what we see coming out of the COVID-19 crisis as um, areas that we want to focus on as an organization, um, reimbursement for prosthetists and therapists for telehealth. There are some questions here about that. I know we're going to cover that. Um, and, um, you know, AOPA's approach to that, um, as well as uh, how we might best get that, um, you know, through. Yeah, we'll, uh, we'll talk a little bit about that, but I'm also going to put up a save the date for a full on AOPA town hall that we're going to be having. Um, tentatively scheduled. We're definitely going to have it. It's just the date that you'll see is tentative. Um, purely talking about telehealth. Um, this is something that we've talked about uh, at a massively increasing level since this crisis started, both uh, in the AOPA office, not literally in the AOPA offices, but among staff uh, and among the Alliance members as well. So um, we definitely are aware of um, that as a massive topic of conversation. So I'll talk a little bit about it um, in a, a slide that's coming up, but we'll also be having that town hall and I'll put up the save the date for that. And Justin, I know this is also coming up, um, the, the distinction between uh, prosthetists and orthodists uh, and durable yeah. medical equipment suppliers is a big focus and actually the centerpiece of the ask, the main ask that we're going to be pushing 
today, but there are um, several questions in the queue, um, you know, expressing the fact that um, the, the distinction has widened between the two yes. um, benefits and, um, and that prosthetists and orthos should be designated as healthcare professionals. Um, obviously, AOPA supports that, and um, I just wanted to give you an opportunity to speak to that um, since we're getting so many questions about it. Absolutely. So let me uh, let me then kind of zoom ahead a little bit. Um, feel free to keep asking questions about the CARES Act and Paper Paycheck Protection. I don't want to take away from that. Um, but let's um, actually real quick, I'm going to turn it over to Joe McTurnan, um, who I probably needs absolutely no introduction at all, but he's our director of coding uh, and uh, sorry, billing and reimbursement. Uh, so Joe, um, I know Joe is off camera for a little bit, so he'll probably be popped back on. There he is. I'm so back. I'll turn these I'm back. to Joe. And I'm running Joe's slides, so he'll he'll tell me when to move them. Okay, thanks, Justin. And, and I've been here the whole time. I just didn't uh, see a need for 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 you guys to see my uh, my headphone face on the on the screen the whole time. So, but um, let me just say that 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 you know I've uh, I've met with and seen Tammy Duckworth speak many many times over the years at different events that I've been had and other events and. I'd never heard that story before, and that just is a credit to everybody that is uh, involved in patient care, everybody that is taking information in at the front desk, um, anybody that's involved in OMP. I know I've been in OMP now for 22 or 23 years, and the, the, the rewards that I've received working with you folks uh, over the years are just incredible. And to hear that story and to hear the inspiration of that story um, just blows me away, and so so that 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 just a, a little quick personal personal thing there. So thank you everyone for everything you do in this crisis. Um, so talking about what 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 I bring to the table today, I, I just want to cover a couple of the regulatory and policy uh, exceptions, waivers, changes that have taken place uh, as a result of the COVID nineteen crisis, and and the first thing. Uh, that happened that that AOPA actually views as a good thing is that CMS pretty early on in the situation uh, made an announcement that they were going to delay uh, indefinitely, frankly, the implementation of prior authorization for the six codes that they had announced early in the year uh, would be subject to uh, Medicare prior authorization. Now, uh, we can debate prior authorization as a good thing or a bad thing for probably hours. Uh, and not come to a reasonable solution. Uh, if you poll the, the audience here, we'd probably be split about down the middle. What we know is that it has been a positive experience for other providers that have uh, had prior authorization. Medicare has actually exceeded uh, their goals for uh, their decision-making process and has been reasonable and has been fair. So I think prior authorization at the end of the day will not necessarily be a bad thing for the industry. What is important to recognize uh, is that implementing a brand new program and a brand new policy and a whole new way of doing things was probably not the best thing to do in the middle of one of the largest healthcare crises that, that we have ever faced. And uh, Medicare recognized that. So originally scheduled for May 11th, just about a week from now, or even less than a week from now, um, uh, as a partial four state implementation and then a full rollout nationally in October, uh, that has been on, put on hold. We do not have a new implementation date. What we do have from talking to the DME Max and the CME and CMS is that uh, we will get 60 days minimum notice uh, when this program uh, is, is ready to be relaunched before implementation. Uh, and that the span of the delay between state, uh, the, the four state implementation initially and the full nationwide rollout uh, down the road will be about the same. Uh, so we should have about uh, a six-month uh, span between the initial four-state limited rollout and then the full national rollout. So we will keep our eyes open for that. Uh, we are in continuous communication with the DME Max, with CMS on this issue. And as soon as we hear anything on that, uh, we'll let people know. Justin, if you could uh, hit the next slide for me, please. So one of the biggest um, things that has come out that's a positive, if you can find positives in the, in the situation we're in right now, uh, is that CMS really did recognize uh, that right now patient care had to be at the forefront of what people were doing. Everything has to be, all energy has to be focused on patient care uh, and making sure that patients continue to have access to uh, needed care 
both directly related to COVID and frankly, indirectly related to COVID. Um, so they immediately or very soon after the announcement of the public health emergency, uh, very quickly announced uh, that they would be suspending essentially all audit activity through the remainder of the PHE or public health emergency. Uh, there were some questions initially whether this was just postponement audits through the TPE target program and educate program that the DME Max uh, have recently switched over to, or whether this is going to be broader and more larger scale. Uh, we quickly found out that this is really a, a, a halt, a pause for all audit activity, including RACs, including CERT audits, including SMERC, which is the Supplemental uh, Medical Review Contractor audits. Uh, the only time um, that audits are able to continue during this process, and if we could transition the slide on this, uh, Justin, uh, but the only time that, that this is going to happen is um, uh, when there's a, a very bona fide suspicion or expectation of fraud and abuse, which I think we can all support. Uh, if we all learned a lesson from uh, the Operation Brace Yourself is that uh, there are bad people operating in this world and they are going to continue to operate. In fact, they are probably going to uh, try to take advantage of the situation. Um, so CMS does have the right and will continue to audit when there is uh, when there is a very specific expectation or suspicion of fraud and abuse. Um, but, but, but the general run-of-the-mill audit for now, at least, have been put on hold until further notice through the extension and through the end of the public health emergency. We can advance this slide. So there have been a couple of what they call emergency-based waivers that have come about. Uh, these are uh, commonly referred to as 1135 waivers. Uh, one of these waivers involves telehealth, which, uh, like, like Justin said, is a, is a whole other discussion uh, as far as its role in the OMP world. But this was the waiver that basically allows uh, physicians who have always had the ability to use telehealth uh, to really expand how they use telehealth in the interest of keeping patients safe uh, and providing health care without patients having to come in and possibly be exposed to to, uh, to patients with, with the COVID-19 virus. Um, so the telehealth waiver, and then there is a second waiver that was put out there that directly could impact ONP, uh, which is related to the replacement of prosthetic devices and orthotic devices uh, during the public health emergency. Uh, the waiver basically eliminated the need to have a new order uh, or some significant documentation to support the medical need for those replacements. Uh, unfortunately, the nature of these waivers is that um, in order for them to apply, because they apply on a bank blanket basis, meaning that there's nothing that has to be done or decreed uh, other than declaration of the waiver itself, um, the restrictions on those waivers are fairly tight in that uh, for replacement of prosthetics and orthotics under an 1135 waiver, the only devices that this applies to is those that are damaged, lost, stolen, uh, irreparably damaged or destroyed uh, as a direct result of a COVID-19 situation. So uh, it is not across the board, regardless of the reason. When we pushed on this, what we were told was that this would apply in situations, say, where a patient had to be transported to the hospital because of suspicion of COVID-19 for treatment, and somehow their prosthetic device or their orthosis uh, was misplaced and lost and left in the ambulance and never to be seen again. Uh, in that situation, the 1135 waiver would apply. Uh, that could be replaced without additional documentation or orders. Um, the claim would have to have a what is called a CR modifier associated with the claim line, um, and 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 that would be covered under Medicare rules. Unfortunately, uh, that does not address the larger scenario of loss, damage, or irreparable wear for conditions and circumstances not specifically related to COVID-19. So there's not a whole lot of practical use for that, but uh, it is out there if people need it and if it applies. Uh, Justin, if we could advance. Okay, so um, one of the some of the other waivers that aren't necessarily falling under the 1135 blanket waiver provisions, the statutory provisions, uh, was the relaxation pretty much on as many policies uh, as as they can possibly relax uh, to allow for patient care. Now, this is a little bit vague in that there's never been a whole lot of clarification on what exactly is relaxed, what is not relaxed. 
What we do know is that since proof of delivery requirements has always been a condition of payment, uh, and there is absolutely a concern about obtaining proof of delivery documentation from patients that would require close contact, that would require the use of pens, uh, paper, et cetera, that could be contaminated. Uh, CMS has announced and, and announced fairly early on that, that for the duration of public health emergency, uh, there is no requirement for proof of delivery. They will not be denying claims simply because the proof of delivery was not obtained. Does not mean that if you are able to obtain proof of delivery through, say, a shipping service, tracking service, et cetera, that you shouldn't be making every effort to do so. But if you are unable to get that proof of delivery documentation, it should not affect your ability to get paid and reimburse for your claims. Um, it does have to be documented in your medical records that you were not able to obtain that proof of delivery because of concerns about COVID-19. Uh, but that's uh, that's a pretty significant waiver that, uh, in, in our estimates and in our, our research, can cause up to 30 to 35 percent of typical Medicare claim denial simply because the proof of delivery was not obtained properly. So uh, that's some well-needed relief there. Uh, in addition, uh, there's been some flexibility in the appeals process. Uh, AOPA, one of the things that we've uh, we've we've put out there and that we've asked for is some relief. Uh, and some potential uh, settlement options uh, for administrative law judge cases to reduce the backlog, reduce the financial burden on providers there. Uh, that is something that is still in the works and we are still pushing and still working with CMS to try and advance. Uh, but there has been some flexibility in the general appeals process. Uh, and they have actually announced because they need to get as many providers as possible into the system to be able to treat the influx of patients that have come into the system, uh, CMS has essentially said that we are not enforcing uh, facility accreditation requirements. We are not uh, doing significant site visits right now. Uh, we are not. Uh, we are scaling back the suspension of of, of providers, um, which is concerning, and it's concerning to AOPA and it's concerning to ABC and DOC, our two major accrediting organizations. Uh, simply because now may not necessarily be the time to open up the floodgates uh, and allow any provider that wants to uh, to come into a system that has a history of fraud and abuse in the past. So we certainly understand the need to create easy access and to allow providers to be able to treat patients, uh, but just a, a wide open opening of the gates uh, may not have been or may not be in the best interest of keeping potentially fraudulent providers out of the system. So we're watching that very closely as well. I know ABC and DOC have both been very uh, engaged in uh, uh, calls and communication with CMS uh, about their concerns on uh, the, the restrictions being lifted on, on facility accreditation uh, simply from a front abuse standpoint. So um, I don't know, I think that covers my slides, Justin. Do I have more? Let's see. More. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. So, so one of the other options, and, and this is kind of a footnote at this point, but one of the other options uh, that was put out very early in the process uh, to help uh, cash flow issues with providers was what's called the accelerated and advanced payment program. So the accelerated part of this program applies to Part A providers. The advanced payment program uh, applies to Part B providers like O&P providers. Uh, and again, this is not a new program. This is a program that's been in existence for many, many years. What's different about COVID-19 is that uh, CMS basically relaxed the requirements and made it easier for folks to uh, get involved and enrolled in the Medicare Advanced Payment Program uh, during the COVID-19 emergency than they would have in the past. Um, so what this did was this gave providers the opportunity to essentially get up to three months of payments, Medicare payments, in advance of providing any services based on their historical Medicare reimbursement. Uh, it, is, it was a um, kicking the can down the road situation. It was not a grant. It was not technically uh, a loan per se because it wasn't something that you paid back with interest. It was just an advance payment that would then be paid back within 100 or after 120 days uh, by the offset of then future payments. So you were going to pay this money back um, by giving money back down the road on future payments. So um, it was a program that was a viable option 
for a while, and folks, some folks did uh, enroll and take advantage of it. Uh, some of the terms were not terribly favorable to the provider community. Interest rates, if you didn't have claims that uh, that would offset that those those payments in a reasonable amount of time, I think within 60 days, uh, then or 90 days actually. Sorry about that. Um, then the interest rate that would apply would be the prevailing interest rate, which is 10 to 12 percent right now, which is significantly higher than interest rates being offered by uh, most banks through loan processes. So uh, not not the best program in the world, but it was available for co folks that had real immediate cash flow problems. Um, I say it's a footnote because on April 27th, I believe, uh, CMS essentially pulled the pulled this program back. Uh, basically saying that because of the uh, PPP, the patient, uh, the pay, Paycheck Protection Program, because of the Medicare grants that were passed as part of the CARES Act, um, there were enough programs that were putting money out there into the system uh, that this really didn't need to be uh, out there. Uh, whether there were other ulterior motives uh, that people are talking about or not is, is probably fairly likely here. Uh, we may not know what those were, or if those ever were, uh, so it's senseless to speculate, but, but they are no longer accepting applications uh, for the advanced payment program from Part B providers. There is still limited funding available for Part A providers through acceleration, uh, but again, that's not something that, that, that we would have access to. So uh, I wanted to talk about it briefly, but didn't want to spend too much time on it. So I think that covers the regulatory update, yes? It does, but I totally have some questions for Joe. Yes, Joe, you've got lots of questions. Um, so has implementation of competitive bidding been affected by the COVID-19 pandemic? So it has not, that's a really good question. It has not been affected or impacted yet for orthotics and prosthetics. Um, it actually has for what are called non-invasive ventilators. So non-invasive ventilators is one of the product categories that was scheduled to have competitive uh, bidding implemented in January of 2021. Uh, obviously, there is an immediate need uh, and potentially a long-term need for ventilators uh, in the country directly related to the COVID scenario. Uh, so CMS made the decision to remove uh, non-invasive ventilators as a product category for consideration and for inclusion in 2021. Uh, don't have an issue. I don't think AOPA has an issue with that. That makes complete and total common sense. Um, AOPA and, and the OMP Alliance and other groups are very interested in competitive bidding and how it will be impacted by COVID-19, whether the bids that were submitted prior to uh, this scenario are, are truly realistic anymore is a big question. So there's concern about if the program continues uh, or is not delayed, uh, is there going to be an opportunity to at least rebid? Uh, those are all questions that are under consideration right now uh, that AOP is uh, participating in following very closely, uh, but there has not been a broad suspension of uh, competitive bidding as of yet. Great. Thank you for that, Joe. Does the telehealth visit satisfy the face-to-face -face meeting requirement for certifying diabetic uh, shoes? The, the so, shoes. Um, we're actually... Yep, yep. We're actually hoping to get some additional clarification. There seems to be some um, some confusion on that issue because the interim final rule that literally just came out last week uh, essentially said that um, that face to face requirements will now be met by telehealth uh, visits uh, from physicians. Uh, what we have heard previously and what is current uh, understanding is that while uh, telehealth does meet the requirements for a lot of face-to-face -face, uh, interactions with physicians, because the requirement for the certifying physician to have an in-person visit with a patient within six months of the delivery of shoes, um, that, that because that is a statutory requirement, the, the telehealth waivers would not necessarily apply. So that is a very specific question we have asked. We have not gotten adequate guidance on that yet, but we've now gone back and uh, we've submitted additional questions uh, based on the uh, most recent interim final rule, which came out literally last week, uh, and if that changes. So as of right now, 
the uh, the only safe assumption is unfortunately uh, that for diabetics use specifically, uh, because that is a statutory requirement, the face-to-face -face interaction within the previous six months with the certifying physician still has to be documented in that physician records. Thank you, Joe. Um, with respect to the audits that have been suspended, um, this question it, uh, says, how about same and similar audits? Well, here's the thing. So, so audits have been suspended, claim review and, and claim edits have not been suspended. So I cannot say in good faith that audits for same or similar, uh, that for, for prepaid, uh, you know, prepaid claims, or not audits, but, 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 but claim denials for same or similar on, um, claims that have not yet been paid, uh, we can still expect those because those are the result of claim edits that are built into the system. Uh, what I can say is that since RAC audits have been suspended, at least through the remainder of the PAG, uh, you should not be getting RAC audits of any kind, which includes both complex audits uh, and the uh, what are called the automated RAC audits, which same or similar are currently falling under. So uh, if you are still getting RAC audits for same or similar, uh, and you are getting those uh, after mid-March, uh, early April, um, then you should absolutely feel free to contact me and, and they should have been released already. And if they have not been, uh, we can get you in touch with some folks at the RACs that, that, that should be able to help. Okay, great. Um, Joe, I think that is all the questions specifically about the regulatory um, piece. We do have a couple of veterans choice qu questions. I think I'm gonna hold those until after you have a chance to review the rest of that information, Justin. Um, Appreciate that. And um, I know we had a, we had said we we're stopping at three. We're going to keep forging ahead. I hope folks are able to stay with us. Um, uh, we've got a little bit more to get through. So hopefully folks can stay on till the end to uh, get to the to congressional contact portion of this. But um, we will uh, soldier on and please do keep ask, uh, asking those questions and we'll get to any we can get through. And, uh, we're, we're here as long as you need us is what I'm trying to say. Um, so let's talk about the uh, Medicare OMP Patient-Centered Care Act. Uh, this was something, uh, if you were at the last policy forum, which was an idea at that point, because the bill hadn't been introduced. It didn't actually get introduced, as you can see here, until November 22nd of last year. Um, this is different from pieces of legislation we've done in the past. Uh, as the title implies, it's more patient-centered uh, and patient-focused. We made a lot of tweaks to it that we think make it a little bit more palatable on the Hill. Um, Talking about what this does writ large, and we're going to talk about this a lot, I know folks want to, is statutorily uh, distinguishing uh, orthotics and prosthetics from DME. Um, we'll talk about that a lot, so I'm going to kind of leave that bullet there and we'll come back to it. Um, restoring uh, Congress's intent when they uh, sort of, uh, when they came up with the definition of minimal self-adjustment. Um, minimal self-adjustment by definition should be something that you can do yourself uh, cms greatly expanded the definition of uh, minimal self-adjustment uh, and it literally says in it uh, to something that can be adjusted either by you or by a caregiver or a loved one um, i don't know under which definition i don't know how you come up with the definition of self-adjustment where there's literally someone else doing it that doesn't make any sense so restoring the congressional intent minimal self-adjustment is uh, and what devices that includes is hugely important to uh, our industry and to this legislation. Uh, prohibiting drop shipment of orthoses and prostheses. Uh, we heard last year, and I've cut out some slides in the interest of time on this, uh, about the big DOJ bus that happened in May of last year, where there was one point, I think it was 1.2 billion in Medicare fraud uh, that was being perpetrated by these lead generators and these late night ads sending uh, orthotics and braces and things to people who did not need them. Um, and certainly did not know how to put them on. So uh, we carefully honed the language in this bill uh, to make sure that we were cutting out the bad players, <clears throat> excuse me, in that and uh, prohibiting that drop shipment. Um, uh, still allowed under certain circumstances if you've had uh, a consultation uh, with an orthotist, even if it's by phone, uh, just making sure that you've talked to someone who's an expert in this area uh, so you can get your device. But simply having someone call you on the phone asking you if your ankle hurts and then sending you a brace uh, is something that we're trying to outlaw in Congress as well with us on that. Uh, and then exempting orthotists and prosthetists from competitive bidding requirements. Uh, obviously, when someone goes and uh, gets their prosthesis, we would like them to be able to get uh, their uh, orthotics that they need for their other side uh, from 
the same office if possible. So exempting uh, that competitive bidding, making sure that everyone can get what they need in one place uh, is key. So again, that legislation has been introduced. It's HR 5262. Um, we have been pushing hard to get that bill uh, into various uh, uh, end of year or packages or larger uh, legislative packages. Most congressional bills uh, don't pass on their own. As you saw earlier in our presentation, they become part of larger uh, bills. You get a whole bunch of pieces of legislation and you roll them onto one and you pass that because it makes it much easier. Uh, so that uh, has been and will continue to be the tack that we're taking for this bill with the exception of that uh, distinguishing of OMP from DME. Uh, I'll talk more about that in a second after we talk about where separation currently stands. And I'm not gonna read everything you see on your screen in the interest of time, but say, uh, suffice to say, uh, there is separate statutory coverage for OMP and DME, but we are not recognized as uh, practitioners or providers of healthcare. We are recognized as suppliers of BME. And that uh, continually uh, con uh, continues to negatively impact our profession and the work that we're doing. And it also uh, comes as a bit of a surprise when you tell that to members of Congress. Uh, when you say, well, you know, we, we, we do these things and you heard Senator Duckworth say, you know, she received a prosthesis, but then the care that she received after that uh, and how important that was to her. Um, it comes as a surprise to a lot of members of Congress that we bill for that device. We don't bill for services. Um, so that is why it's very important and folks on this call seem to know that based on the questions that uh, this further separation is needed. We need to distinguish OMP from DME. Um, and so that is, uh, again, section one of HR 5262. Um, and again, I'm not gonna labor the point too much by reading all of this, um, but I do wanna draw some focus to that last bullet, uh, which we've been talking about a lot in-house recently, which is it paves the way for potential telehealth bill and increased data uh, collection. We have been getting calls from staffers early on uh, in the process of uh, drafting some of these CARES Acts. Uh, legislative staffers would say, well, we're gonna do X and Y on, on telehealth um, and what do you guys think about this and asking for our opinions um, and after consulting with Ashley and Joe on our staff we you know came to realize that uh, or I came to realize that you know it's tough for us to take a position on this because we don't bill for it uh, you know again we bill for the we bill for the product we don't bill for the service and so it um, came as a huge shock to many of the congressional staffers the first uh, domino to, that needs to fall to get us where we need to be, not just for telehealth, uh, but for any number of uh, other um, advances in our industry is to st uh, distinguish OMP from DME. And again, I don't want to belabor the point, but it's it's so hugely important. Um, I think we're going to open up another poll uh, just to kind of gauge the interest on this as well. Um, but let me move ahead before we do that real quick. And note again that we do have a save the date uh, on the town hall uh, for Thursday, May 14th at 1 p.m. Um, I hope folks will join us for that. Again, that's a tentative date. Uh, please save it uh, on your on your calendar just to make sure it's there. Uh, but we're gonna devote a whole uh, hour and change probably to talking about this as an issue. Uh, but we would like to know who is using this in their practice. So we're gonna pause temporarily to open up this poll. Um, and once that's open, I will keep talking. So Justin, uh, just uh, I'm I'm throwing myself out there. I opened the poll, and then when you oh, said, "Wait a second, I closed it, and now I can't open it back up." So jo yeah. oh, Joy got it. She's amazing. There it is. Okay, the poll's open. So uh, while people take that poll, uh, and appreciate people taking it, um, I do want to note, and I'm going to get into this in a second. Um, that part of uh, the uh, the Patient-Centered Care Act of HR 5262 that would distinguish OMP from DME. We're fighting for that to be in the next COVID bill. You heard, uh, you saw my slide on that. You heard Senator Duckworth talk about that. that there's another bill coming. Uh, most of the work on that is gonna be done in the House. Um, so we have gone to the sponsors of that bill, uh, Congressman Mike Thompson of California and GK Butterfield of uh, um, North Carolina are the Democrats on that bill. Brett Guthrie of Kentucky and uh, G.T. Thompson of Pennsylvania are the Republican leads on that bill. And we've gone to them and said, look, um, it may not sound like, and there has been an emphasis, I should say this, on making sure that whatever legislation gets passed, whatever language gets into those bills is directly related to COVID and helping COVID patients um, and expanding healthcare with the ultimate goal of helping more COVID patients. So when we initially went and we said, look, this is related to COVID, this separation, because it will pave our way to telehealth. It will, there, there's, uh, you know, and our folks are on the front line. There are uh, folks uh, in 
uh, ICUs, fitting TLS, uh, TLSOs. Um, we're finding out now that COVID causes, uh, can cause blood clotting. And we've heard stories not only about young people, way too young to be suffering strokes after they get COVID are suffering strokes. Um, there are also increasing stories coming out about people who are uh, requiring amputations because of those same blood clots. Um, and, you know, Tammy used the word, we're on the front line of that. Those are her words. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say that's what Tammy Duckworth said, that we're on the front lines of this. So to have us only being uh, viewed as suppliers of DME and not practitioners of care and, and providers of health care, not just supplies, is insane to us. And so presenting that argument the way we're presenting it to, to the Hill, I think, is resonating. Um, I am finding out now that we are not able to open that poll. So I have been forging ahead. I will continue to forge ahead. So um, that is our next step. We want to include Section 2A, that's distinguishing OMP from DNE, in that next COVID bill. That is what we are uh, working. That's what I'm spending most of my days working on, uh, on, on the phone and on Skype calls and, and Zoom meetings with members of Congress and their staff. Uh, when we finish uh, our uh, session today, uh, I will ask all of you to write your members of Congress um, on this issue, we're gonna have three issues you can choose from, but I would ask that you all write on this issue because they are working on that bill right now this second. Um, so we're waiting on confirmation uh, from Congressman Thompson that they are including that. Uh, the telehealth argument is resonating soundly with them, especially with Congressman Thompson himself. He's a huge proponent of using telehealth uh, in this crisis uh, to make things easier on both the patients and the providers. Um, so when we were on a, a Zoom meeting last week and we were talking about uh, that, that this doesn't apply to us, uh, it resonated. And so I'm hopeful, fingers crossed, that we'll get it in there, but we need your grassroots help to make that happen. Uh, so that is our big legislative push right now. Let's get Section 2A in that next COVID bill. Uh, looking at the larger legislation, again, we've still got the rest of this year to get that passed. There are other pieces of legislation that are going to go uh, through Congress, so we want to make sure that we're considered in any of that. So part of that is garnering as many co-sponsors on that bill, H.R. 5262, as we can get. Uh, you have a role in that as well. There's another legislative ask on our AOPA votes page just to have your members co-sponsor that legislation. Uh, so you'll see that when we get to that part. Uh, working with committee staff to make sure we get a hearing, not entirely necessary. There's a way that uh, our bill is in front of the, uh, the House Energy and Commerce Committee. Uh, Frank Pallone is the chair of that committee. He likes to have everything done by regular order, which is to say that first chart that you saw way back two hours ago, where there's, uh, you know, the committees are supposed to look at this first before we move on to the House floor. Um, so to get a hearing on that, to have the committee hear it is a huge step, not 100% necessary, um, but we would like to get that done. And then, of course, we're still waiting on a Senate companion bill. Senator Warner uh, of Virginia is uh, very ready and very opposed to, to, to introduce this bill. Uh, we have Republicans who are on board. Senator Cornyn of Texas is on board with this bill. Senator Cassidy of Louisiana. Um, but neither of them are going to lead. We want someone who's going to be a major pusher of this bill to speak about it on the House floor, to, write, uh, to, to make phone calls to other legislators, to write what they call dear colleague letters, garnering interest in those bills. So we have bipartisan interest, but we need a Republican who's really going to go all in and say, this is my bill. Uh, we're looking at a couple of senators who, uh, you know, prior to COVID being the major priority, were, were uh, about to jump on that bill. Those can, discussions will continue, but obviously, uh, COVID has put a lot of that on hold, um, but that is a big part of what we want to do next. Um, I'm going to pause there. Oh, and uh, and of course, get it into a, a larger year impact. I'm going to pause there because uh, we've got Katrina ready to uh, come up and talk about the wounded. Uh, but let me pause there since I know that the separation and the telehealth, uh, I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about the telehealth because we will have the town hall. Uh, but if there are any questions about the distinguishing uh, OMP from DME, whether it's in 5262 or in the COVID bill, please ask those questions. I am ready to take them. Yes, so um, we have several questions, uh, more some comments about telehealth being, you know, good sure. and people being very supportive of those efforts um, and, you know, supportive for certain appointments, obviously. Um, and um, yeah, we got a lot of feedback about the telehealth. People responded in um, the, the chat function. So thank you to all who have responded in the chat function to that poll question. Yes, um, please. There I'm... are a few other questions. Um, where are we with gaining a lead Republican in the Senate? 
Yeah. So as I said, um, prior to, to COVID being the becoming the focus, as obviously it should be, uh, Senator Steve Daines of Montana um, was very close to uh, coming on board and Senator Ben, ben Sass. Um, we had had extended conversations with both of them. Um, both of them were, I don't want to say close to saying yes, but they were certainly far from saying no. They were both intrigued with it. We had very good conversations. Um, but now with other commitments, um, they're not able to kind of jump in. And frankly, even if they were, this is not the time where we want to roll out a bill like that because it wouldn't, you want it to get a little bit of attention and we want to be able to send a dear colleague and we want to be able to draw up interest on the Senate once it gets introduced. Getting it introduced now, it would get lost in the shuffle. So we want to kind of hold our powder until, uh, you know, who knows when this will all die down, but we want to, when it's more appropriate, I guess is, is what I'll say to get that introduced. So. Uh, we'll be resuming those conversations uh, very soon. The Senate is back and it seems like they're going to resume their normal schedule as of this week. Uh, the House has been out. They'll come back next week. Um, and so uh, we're, we're close to two leads, um, but obviously we'll keep folks posted. And as soon as we have a Senate uh, sponsor, Senator Warren will be on board. They'll roll out that bill. Senator Duckworth will be another original sponsor on the Democrat side. Uh, but you will certainly hear about it. We'll, we'll sing it from the mountains once it's, once it's introduced. Great. Does Duckworth um, have any suggestions? Uh, yeah, you just spoke to that about um, possible support in, in, um, as a Republican. So um, my, good, good question there, Jim. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, we also have a few other questions um, about uh, telehealth in general. Um, it, from a from a long term perspective, obviously, um, we want ONP. Um, clinicians to be recognized for their services. And uh, again, uh, could you emphasize um, the importance of, of separation distinguishing and the reason that that's our number one ask um, today? Sure. Um, so there just remains this uh, on the Hill and off the Hill, frankly, this, this idea that somehow, and this was a surprise to me, frankly, I've been at AOPA for 14 months. And so when I found out that, no, we're, we're considered suppliers of this equipment. And I thought, well, what about the constant images I've, that we see? And I've, I've shown them in this in this presentation of folks working directly with the patients, helping them walk, checking their gait, all of this follow-up work that gets done. Um, isn't that part of the, the treatment? Isn't that part of the care? And of course it is, but that's not what we bill for. We bill for the, you know, we bill, as Joe McTernan has said, and, uh, you know, I, I say this in every congressional meeting, we bill for equipment. We don't bill for services. Um, and so to explain that to members of Congress, they're a little shocked, even if they are well versed in uh, in medicine and health. Uh, you know, they've they've heard tons of stories from every organization that comes in the door and they hear that and they say, well, that just doesn't make any sense. Um, so, you know, being able to say um, to distinct that that first step that needs to get done is Congress creating statute that separates that pulls out the words orthotics and prosthetics from that definition of durable medical equipment. Just that separation is the first domino to fall. That lets us go to CMS and say, look, Congress recognizes this is not who we are and what we do. There's much more to it. Um, and it helps us build a much bigger argument. But without that first domino falling, it's really, really hard to get anything else done. It's really hard to say that we can create codes to build for telehealth or whatever that's going to look like. And I'm not saying that is what that's going to look like at all, but whatever that would look like, we can't do that without that separation. Uh, we can't start talking about data registries unless we get that separation, unless there are different ways to look at our profession. Um, so we have to get that domino to fall. Um, more Congress, uh, members of Congress is, are, are members of Congress are buying into that, uh, but we still got a lot of work to do and I hope you'll help us with that. Perfect, Justin, thank you so much. It was a long-winded answer to a very easy question, but um, with that, I am going to uh, turn it over to uh, Katrina McDonald from Lynchpin Strategies, and uh, I very much apologize, Katrina, that we're keeping you waiting so long to do your part of this presentation, but thank you very much for being on to talk about the Wounded Warrior Bill. It's my pleasure, and I'm so sorry that we're not all together in person to see your smiling faces. So I'm going to be a little shorter than we had planned because uh, we're keeping yeah. folks. And the next part that we're getting to, which is the activating the outreach to Congress that Terry and the senator talked about, is the most important part. I'd like to start by saying I really recognize it feels a little weird to be talking about expanding the pipeline of ONP clinicians right now when the field is facing furloughs and layoffs and reducing staff hours. But if we're gonna be ready to provide post-coronavirus care, 
we've got to address what we know is a looming 60% shortage in masters certified and, and trained clinicians to help meet care. And in fact, that um, need may be growing because we know that coronavirus is related in hospitalized patients with sepsis and with amputation. And so to the extent that there are coronavirus survivors leaving hospitals over the next several months, many of them are going to be new amputees. And we've got to be ready to help our existing patients as well as uh, our coronavirus patients coming out the other side of this. So in spite of the demand and the shortage, um, orthotics and prosthetics programs don't have the capacity to train enough clinicians. And that is a question that congressional members and staff ask because the idea is if the market needs it, why wouldn't the universities that currently have master's programs respond? And the answer is that OMP programs are really costly to run. They need a lot of space, they need a lot of equipment, they need updated equipment, and they are pretty labor intensive in terms of the size of classes that the instructors can teach. This is not a business school or a law school where you can put several hundred students in a lecture hall and you only need one professor. So current programs are not able to expand without help and support, and they just aren't graduating the number of clinicians we need to provide care in the future. And that's where the legislation that AOPA has been working on comes in. Justin, if you'd like to move us to the next slide, I'm going to talk about a change in strategy this year. I know that many of you who are on this webinar um, have heard before about the Wounded Warrior Workforce Enhancement Act, which is a grant program that would go through the Department of Veterans Affairs to create competitive grants for master's degree programs. They would be an opportunity for existing programs to expand their class sizes, and also an opportunity for schools that don't currently have master's degree programs but would like to offer them could apply for funding to help create a master's degree program. This year, we have an opportunity to take a slightly different tactic. And although we are continuing to support the Wounded Warrior Bill that goes through the Veterans Affairs uh, Department, and that is important, we are working with Senator Duckworth, who is a member of the Senate Armed Services Committee, to do parallel legislation through the Department of Defense this year. And we've got an opportunity, we think, to move this forward, in part because Senator Duckworth is sponsoring this in the Armed Services Committee. The chairman of the committee, Senator Inhofe, has a university in Oklahoma that is interested in applying for these grants, and they have been working closely with Chairman Inhofe's office. There are additional members of the Armed Services Committee in the Senate that have also submitted this as a request, including Senator Durbin of Illinois, who's not a member of the Armed Services Committee, but is the highest ranking Democrat on the committee that has to fund this if we get the authorizing legislation passed. So we are cautiously optimistic that after many years of trying to push this through the Veterans Committee, we might have a really great opportunity this year to finally get this done through the Department of Defense. The language that we're working on through DOD is a little bit different in really important and significant ways. So the Wounded Warrior Bill that would go through the Department of Veterans Affairs has small grants and only about $5 million a year for three years. So programs that didn't get funded in the first year would need to reapply in the second year. If they didn't get money in the second year, they'd have the opportunity to reapply for a third year. In the updated legislation that we are working on with the Department of Defense, um, we've upped the total from $30 million to $45 million. I'm sorry, from $15 million to $45 million. That acknowledges that costs have increased, and we are asking for that total pot to be made available in one year so that more schools could get the money and we can have this impact the clinician pipeline much faster. We've been working on this for a long time. We're much closer to 
our tipping point of losing clinicians, and we need to get this ramped up soon. So the updated language that is being requested in the Armed Services Committee reflects that. So this is where you come in, because we've got an opportunity now to push this forward. This is the list of members on the Senate Armed Services Committee, and only four of them represent states that have schools in their states. So the folks in those schools have been working with their senators on this committee, but really any senator on this committee could benefit from this legislation because everybody is short and everybody needs additional clinicians. So we're showing you this list because we'd like you to scan and see if your senators a senator from your state is on the Armed Services Committee. If your senator is on the Armed Services Committee, it is particularly important that you talk about the need for funding to expand, expand master's degrees in ONP when you send your emails in a few minutes. And if you don't have anybody from your state on the Senate Armed Services Committee, we're about to show you a much longer list for the House Armed Services Committee, which is a really big committee. And many of you, slides. sorry? Two slides, so this is not all of them. Yeah, we'll it, it is, it's a long list. Um, so <laughs> take a look at the first half of the committee. Obviously the folks in blue are Democrats, the folks on the red side are Republicans. In the Senate, we know the Republicans are in the majority. In the House, the Democrats are in the majority. And so you might not be in Adam Smith's congressional district, but if you are in the state of Washington, Adam Smith is the chairman, and we want your member of the Washington delegation to be reaching out to the chairman to say this is important to Washington state, not just to the particular district that the University of Washington is in. For you as an OMP provider in Washington, this is important even if you are not the University of Washington looking to expand its program. So we very much hope that you can help us with this outreach in just a few minutes. Everybody across the country is in a position to benefit from expansion of master's degree programs. But if you're in a state that's represented on the House or Senate Armed Services Committee, you have a special opportunity to weigh in with the people who can really make the most important difference on this. And thank you in advance for your willingness to do so. Absolutely. Um, any questions for uh, Katrina before we get to uh, where you will all reach out to your members of Congress? I hope that you will all reach out to your members of Congress. Actually, while we're waiting for questions, one important addition. When we are writing about the Wounded Warrior Bill, we've talked a lot about veterans and how important expansion of care for veterans is. We don't want to talk about veterans in communications with the Armed Services Committee, because if we send stuff to people who care about the Department of Defense and all we talk about is veterans, they're going to say, the Department of Veterans Affairs needs to do this. This is not our job. So in our communications about language in the Armed Services Committee, we want to talk about how a trained cadre with a sufficient number of ONP providers is really important for military readiness. We heard Tammy Duckworth talk about Dennis Clark, who provided her care at Walter Reed. Yeah. Dennis was able to give high quality care to wounded warriors because of his years of service treating civilians. So in our communications with the Armed Services Committee, we want to talk about meeting military readiness needs, not veterans. Thank you. Uh, do we have any questions for Katrina on, the, on this legislation and this new way we're doing it? Um, we do have a, a specific question about the closure of educational programs. Um, if either one of you can speak to that. Sure. So closure of educational programs generally or ONP programs. There are currently 12 ONP master's degree programs. There was a 13th in Georgia at Georgia Tech. 
that program closed a couple of years ago, um, again, because it's so costly and it was really expensive for, the, um, for Georgia Tech to support that program. The folks at Georgia Tech in that program have um, moved it to Kennesaw State, which is also in Georgia. Um, I think initially their plan was that they would be accepting students this fall in 2020. That was delayed to the fall of 2021, even before coronavirus hit. And I've not talked to anybody at um, in Georgia recently to see how coronavirus might uh, potentially delay that further. But there is no question that as state budgets diminish and the demands on them increase, it is very likely that all of the universities that are running ONP programs are going to take hits to their budgets. And it's hard to predict what might happen as a result of that. Oh, great. Thank you, Katrina. We have another um, question about um, how we know there is a deficiency of ONP providers. Um, sure. This I'm sorry, I, I glossed over that bullet. If we could go back a few slides, Justin. There have been two studies commissioned of the field of ONP. The most recent was commissioned in 2015, and it was commissioned by ENCOPE of a health analysis firm, independent and not formally connected with the ONP field except as consultants. And they did an analysis, a very detailed analysis, we can send it to you if you would like to see it, um, that looks at the growing demand for ONP services, in particular as baby boomers age, diabetes, cardiovascular disease. They looked at all of those factors and calculated their estimated need for ONP services. And then they looked at the demographics of the field. And like many allied health programs or allied health fields, we have an aging workforce and um, more than 50%, I believe, uh, of current ONP master's level, sometimes they're really experienced and grandfathered in, and sometimes they actually have master's degrees in ONP. But at that level of the workforce, about 50% were already eligible for retirement or would be eligible in just a couple of years. And so looking at the supply, the number of students who would be graduating from ONP programs, the number of people who would be retiring, and then the need in terms of the trajectory of patients, they calculated that estimated 60% shortfall. I would point out that in their analysis, they said that it'll be a 60% shortfall if all of our assumptions sort of hold true. And when they did that analysis, there were 13 programs, 13 master's programs that were graduating 250 students a year. Since then, one of them has closed. And so we're graduating fewer students now than we were at the time that their analysis was done. So the assumptions have changed and they've changed for the worse. So 60% could actually be an optimistic figure given that we're gonna have several years of only 12 programs graduating students instead of 13. Thank you for that clarification. Um, another question, is there an advantage to have a state with multiple schools available for ONP? I think some of that probably just um, depends on how, how those schools were able to get funding to open those programs, but um, is, there, is there anything else uh, to, to that question? So one thing that we know is it's absolutely an advantage to have a school in your state because students tend to do residencies close to the program and stay in the area. And that's not just true of ONP, that's very true of graduate programs in almost any field. Um, given how few programs there are, a state would be really lucky to get more than one. Uh, I believe Texas is the only one that currently has more than one. Um, so if I were a clinician, I would want my state to have as many master's degree programs as possible. Um, but those of you who have at least one are certainly blessed. Thank you. Um, we'll some of the funds 
be able to be used to attract students into the field um, so we can fill the current and upcoming seats with qualified applicants. So right now, at least to date, finding qualified applicants has not been a problem. When we talk to the schools, they're telling us that they have 10 qualified applicants for every available seat in a program. So shortage of folks who want to enter the field is not our program, uh, is not our problem. The bottleneck is in uh, having places for those students in our training programs. Just a couple of people pointing out that California has two programs. Um, yes, forgive me, thank you. Um, and uh, there's a, just um, food for thought about um, the length of the programs and the clinical versus research tracks. Um, I think that's commentary versus question. Um, I don't see any additional questions at this time. Thank you, Katrina. Thank, thank, thank you. you so much, Katrina, very much appreciated. Um, so before we uh, let people go, and thank you so much for staying with us. I know we are over on time, given this is our first time we've ever done this. Um, I hope you'll forgive us for uh, talking more as opposed to less. Um, but I do want to give people the opportunity to take action. Normally, we would all be on the Hill today, uh, going office to office, uh, but we can't do that. So let's make our voices heard as best we're able um, without being on the Hill. And so uh, I'm going to ask all of you in a moment, I'm kind of going to go live on my screen here and show people how to use uh, the AOPA Votes page. So I would ask uh, in a second, uh, people go to aopavotes.org, A-O-P-A votes, V-O-T-E-S dot org. Um, but I do want to let people know, as Jeff said at the outset, um, everybody who writes their member of Congress today, um, we are CC'd on those letters, we see them, um, and we're very appreciative of them. One person who takes action today uh, will get what is on your screen right now, which is to say a full conference registration to our 2020 assembly, which is still on as of now, so uh, in beautiful Las Vegas. Uh, round trip limousine transfer to and from the airport, uh, room of the strip view, uh, three nights stay, and two spa services. So we will choose uh, one letter at random that was sent to Congress um, and uh, choose that. Now we are not, I need to specify this, we are not rewarding you for writing your member of Congress. That is not what we're doing. I'm rewarding you personally for your advocacy. That is a different animal. So uh, with that said, I am going to go uh, live on my screen here to aopavotes.org. Um, and I'm going to back up one stop right here. So here on AOPA Votes, uh, and this is uh, uh, real time from my screen, you'll see three alerts. One, uh, distinguished orthotics and prosthetics from DME in the next COVID bill. Uh, here you'll see the Medicare Orthotics and Prosthetics Patient Centered Care Act. Over a thousand of you have already taken action on that, and for that we're greatly appreciated. Uh, appreciative. Uh, and then the Wounded Warrior Workforce Enhancement Act. This one has been, uh, we had 117 people write on this, but this one has been rewritten, as you can see, even with this uh, technical glitch there, uh, to uh, uh, to be uh, represent our new ask of the Department of Defense and getting that into the National Defense Authorization Act. So when you click on add your voice here from aopavotes.org, uh, you'll see apparently nothing. That's not cool. Well, normally you would see uh, an alert, here we go. Um, so on the left of your screen, you'll see kind of an overview uh, of our issue, uh, real quick, kind of two sentence overview. Uh, and then what we always do is go into more detail. So you can, you can get what you need out of this, uh, but your main talking points are gonna be down here uh, and some links to, to get you to more information. So uh, feel free to read that if you're so inclined. Um, but what we also do after you fill in your information here is we pre-write the letter for you. Um, everything you need is already in this letter, but, and I can't stress this enough, please do personalize this. Talk about what you've seen during this pandemic, the patients that you've treated, tell obviously without giving away uh, personal identifying data or information, please talk about specific patients, the care they've gotten, um, that is hugely, hugely important. What we don't want is uh, 150 or 200 letters that all look exactly the same going to Congress. Uh, these need to be personalized. Uh, if you, you went back to that uh, uh, slide that I had on constituent communications, they want letters that are personal, personalized communication from constituents. So even though we do, do fill in everything you need uh, on this email, please do personalize it. Um, delete what you think you need to delete, add what you think you need to add, but please do uh, um, add in your own story. Um, 
I've already written in here for you that you're a constituent. You're not going to be able to write anybody um, who doesn't represent you. Uh, the system doesn't let you do that, and they wouldn't want to read those emails anyway. Um, the other thing you can do if you are so inclined and if you are savvy with social media, click on this little Twitter button. Um, I'm not going to do it right now in the interest of time, but if you put in your address and your zip code, it will automatically generate a tweet for you to send to your legislators. Um, uh, they're all on Twitter, so you'll know you get one. Again, please do try to put, personalize that as much as you're able within a 280 character limit. I know that's not easy. There will be pre-populated message there, but please do tinker with that. Um, personalization of this is hugely, hugely important. And when they send back, this is also important, when they send back a thank you letter, when they send back something, the legislative correspondent or somebody writes back and says, thank you for bringing this to our attention, follow up again, um, because this bill is gonna move pretty quick. They're writing it right now. We anticipate votes maybe as soon as next week. So write back and say, well, did you do it? You know, I wanted this, uh, this language, uh, distinguishing OMP from DME in the COVID bill. Did you support that? Did you help make that happen? So please do follow up. Um, we can't do this without advocates like you. It just doesn't get done. This bill was not introduced because of, uh, solely because of work we did. It was introduced because you all helped, because you all laid the groundwork last year uh, by walking around on the Hill and talking about this legislation. So we cannot do it without you. Your advocacy is vital and hugely appreciated. So with that, I will pause again for questions. Um, I, I will uh, stay on for a minute while people write these letters if they are running into any issues with the system. Um, but I will also say on behalf of, of Terry and Katrina and Joe and Ashley and everyone, Jeff and everyone else who was part of this, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for being with us today. I know we are way over on time and appreciate that as well. So thank you, thank you, thank you. So with that, I will ask if there are any more questions. Yes, actually, we have a really a couple of really good um, functionality questions. So awesome. um, folks are asking about addresses, the addresses they should use, and um, sure. they, would, they should use their home address, um, but can they also submit one using their work address? Yes. Please note that when you personalize your letter, um, hi Terry, please note that uh, when you when you write your email, uh, you know, on the top, it says, I pre-wrote as a constituent. Make sure you're sending that one to whoever is at the, your home address. So when you enter your home address, that's the one you'll use. Um, but Please do go back in if you live in a different congressional district, send another one and say, I'm a business owner uh, in your district. I treat patients who live in your district. That's a huge, huge thing with members of Congress. You might not live there, but you're treating their patients. And you're going to talk about the care or the conversations that you've had and your interactions with these members of Congress to their patients, uh, to their constituents, your patients, their constituents. They know that. So definitely do both, but distinguish I'm a constituent in one and a business owner prosthetist, orthotist, um, you know, I treat patients in your in your district in the other. We have a couple more questions. If if tweeting to an office, um, is it more appropriate to tweet from a company account or personal account? Uh, I would argue personal simply because you want to be viewed as a constituent. Plus, uh, I mean, if you're the owner of the company and you have no problem with that, great. But you don't want to go ruffling any feathers if you're like the communications director or anything. So get permission before you do it. Um, it, neither one of them hurt, but they, you know, again, it kind of comes down to are you a constituent, are you not a constituent? So if you're a constituent in their district, tell them that. If you're a business owner in their district and you tweet from the business account, tell them that as well. Um, so I don't necessarily think one is better than the other. Um, just make sure you're not, uh, especially from the business account, saying anything particularly partisan or anything like that. So. Since we're sending letters as our main form of advocacy um, during this, this event, um, normally we would do follow-up and follow-up would include this exact type of, of outreach. Yeah. What, kind of, what can follow-up look like uh, in this new environment? So that's where the, uh, and I'll let Terry speak to this as well, but I think that's where uh, you know phone calls to the office saying, hey, I sent a letter. Is it okay if I talk to your health staffer about this? Or when, the, when you get a letter back, uh, a response back, and you should, following up and saying, hey, did you do it? Uh, pick up the phone and call them by all means. Um, your legislators probably aren't gonna be home for a little while, so in-district visits are off the table, but when they're back uh, and things return to a little bit of normalcy, try to get that in-person visit as well, and we can help you do that. My email address is on the screen. I will help you do that. So I will also ask Terry to weigh in on that since she's an expert at this. Well, I would just add that invite them to your ONP facility uh, if you are an owner or a practitioner. 
see if that's something that uh, your business is willing to do, invite them into the facility when the time is right. Uh, if you are a an end user or patient and you would like to also see if a visit is appropriate, uh, work with your prosthetists and business owners uh, at your facility and see. Uh, and keep that connection strong in any way that you can. Uh, we talked about um, phone calls, we talked about emails, uh, we talked about all the different ways to reach out virtually. If you'd like to schedule a virtual meeting, and if you do, please connect back with us and let us know that you did that and how that went. I know I will be working uh, with Minnesota with a group of us to do that here uh, as well. So lots of different ways to do it, as long as you're keeping the connection strong, uh, starting it, making it, keeping it strong in any way you can. Uh, and I know that's uh, it's difficult uh, right now with, with COVID, but uh, we're going to do the best we can, and we're just going to keep a positive thought and keep those connections strong. Great. Thank you, Terry. Um, Justin, you mentioned um, being able to set up in-person visits once that's um, possible again, and I'm sure AOPA will be sending lots of communications out when things are um, up and running appropriately and, and it's the tide is, is um, there for that. Are there other um, outreach opportunities, things that AOPA can assist our members in, um, you know, phone calls, things like that? Is there, yep. is there something we can do to help them communicate with uh, their members of Congress? Yeah, and I was I was just going to bring that up actually. Is uh, you saw earlier, uh, you know, me on a couple of Zoom calls with members of Congress. Um, we can absolutely. I can't promise that you'll Zoom with your member of Congress. Um, it's possible, but we can definitely get you on with a staffer. Um, so if you want that to happen, and if you want us to help facilitate that, even if you just want the name and contact information of the staffer, so you can do it yourself. My email address is on the screen. Please do reach out. Um, and I can help facilitate that. The other thing I will make a plug for before I forget, um, and I had a slide on this that I had to delete, um, we have a government relations committee at AOPA. We have just opened nominations for our committee structure. Um, we have a government relations committee. If you wanna get more involved with what we do and you wanna be a part of uh, the work that I'm doing every single day, which I assure you is a heck of a lot of fun, um, please do reach out and I will tell you how to get involved with our government relations committee. We'd love to have you. Great. Well, that is um, that's all the questions I see here. Um, so I'll leave it to you to Excellent. close us out. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I said my goodbye, so I'll actually let Terry close us out. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you all. Oh my gosh, another wonderful AOPA Policy Forum. A little bit different this year, but special just the same. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, please don't hesitate to reach out to Justin or Joe or me please. or anyone at the at AOPA to help you in any way we can be an effective advocate for our community. Thank you and have a wonderful rest of your day. Stay well. Thank you, everybody.